Good afternoon and welcome to a House Foreign Affairs Committee markup. In accordance with House rules of The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the Committee at any point. Pursuant to Committee, committee Rule 4, the Chair may postpone further proceedings on approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment. And without objection, all members will have five days to submit statements or extraneous materials on today's business. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously circulated address or contact full committee staff. As a reminder to members joining remotely, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you are not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. And consistent with House rules, staff will only mute members as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum. As members were notified on Monday, the committee intends to consider H.R. 3524, the Eagle Act, and its amendments. Any roll call, any roll call votes will be postponed to the end of the markup. And I now recognize myself for opening remarks. You know, when I uh, ascended to the chairmanship of the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. One of the commitments I made to uh, my colleagues who were uh, so kind enough to give me their support, I vowed to them uh, when I spoke with them that I would tackle the most complex and the most difficult foreign policy, policy challenges of our day, and that we would not duck problems, dodge disagreements, or sit idly by and let other actors drive American foreign policy. And so today, I think, is one of those days. And I will stand by that pledge uh, that I made, and that's why we will take up, or are taking up, H.R. 3524, the Eagle Act, and take on the responsibilities that we have as members of Congress and as members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee of addressing the China challenge. So before I, let me stop here for a second because I really want to thank Ranking Member McCall, who has worked diligently uh, with me uh, and our respective staffs. I want to thank the staffs of both the Democratic side and the Republican side because we tried, they worked hard trying to come together in the same spirit of this committee, trying to figure out if we can do something. And I know people are anticipating a long day and night. Um, and I know it would have been great if we could have had something done and been out of here in an hour or so, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes, Unfortunately, deals can't be reached or struck. Compromises can't be broken. But I still thank Mr. McCall and your staff because they did work hard. And we worked hard. We've had conversations in that regards. And sometimes there's really differences. One of those differences that I think that is tremendously uh, important, I know it's important to me, 
that we just were not going to, you know, that's why I decided, you know, after we tried to push back the markup for a couple of times, it became clear to me that we were not going to get to agreement. And one of those big issues was climate change. It just, I didn't see that we could get there. And for me, that's significant. For me, you know, I just had my second granddaughter uh, on April 1st. I want to make sure there's a planet for them to live on. Uh, we come, you know, looking to some of my colleagues from the West Coast who had record heat. We talk about uh, issue, issues or situations that's taking place right next to us with, in Central and South America and the climate changing that's causing migration into the United States and other places, it's causing famine in other places. So to me, it's an issue that we've got to deal with. And I recognize that some and respect, though some don't believe as I do. And that's part of what we are as a country. And those, are, so therefore we, we have debate. But to me, if we're gonna deal with climate change, you have to deal with China. China is the world's largest global emitter. In 2019, it emitted 14 gigatons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It was responsible for 27% of global emissions. The United States and the EU combined accounted for only 17%. Yet, instead of reversing course, China is broadening, broadening its dirty energy portfolio. They've been increasing the number of coal plants at home and abroad as part of their Belt and Road Initiative, while strategically positioning themselves in the solar industry as exporters to more responsible nations. So, I'm not going to deny elide or hide from these simple facts. The Eagle Act covers various age, uh, areas. The Eagle Act is strong on human rights, another area very important to me, as I've indicated earlier at other hearings. And in this bill, it includes vital language on the ongoing human rights violations in Hong Kong. It reaffirms American policy towards Tibet and it calls out the genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. It includes tough provisions making sure that we are not importing products that resulted from forced labor and create pathways out of Hong Kong and Xinjiang for those that have been persecuted by the PRC. It also calls for a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics and calls for the IOC to delay and rebid the games if the PRC doesn't stop its atrocities in, 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 in Xinjiang. This is the most far-reaching bill to protect the Uyghurs ever to come out of the United States Congress. The Eagle Act is a comprehensive piece of legislation, ensuring American leadership on vaccines to end this pandemic once and for all. It covers and bolsters Arctic diplomacy. It's in here. Strengthening our diplomatic and financial presence in Africa to counter Chinese cohesion on the continent. An important part of the bill also deals with the Western Hemisphere, South Asia, Europe. All are included in this bill. And as I said before, that I believe the Eagle Act, as introduced, is a strong bill. But the substitute we are considering today, we will consider today, is even stronger. We have further bolstered our provisions on Taiwan, our staunch diplomatic friend, and I want to thank Chairman Berra for his leadership on that front. There's new sections on Chinese surveillance companies and Chinese censorship by Mr. Malinowski furthering American aims and underscores our value, and I thank him. Human rights provisions have been strengthened, economic points refined, and the climate section further enhanced. And so therefore, I want to thank all members who have reached out for their thoughtful input. Now today, I know we will have additional viewpoints laid before us. And my view is basically straightforward. We're going to listen, we're going to debate. If they're good ideas, 
we're going to incorporate them. If there's differences of opinion on one side or the other, we're going to vote about it. If I don't support them, we listen. As long as it fits within our rules here, there'll be, there'll be votes. So today's forum is for that. It's for debating and evaluating American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China. And I won't and I don't begrudge any member on either side of the aisle who wants their ideas considered on that topic. So I want to repeat myself and I want to make sure it's clear on both sides. We may differ in our approach on China. And I intend on giving every member of this committee an opportunity to be heard. I hope that we can avoid procedural problems or things that are maybe pointless or tactical in that regard. But I do want a spirited and collegial debate. And I want to thank everyone for their engagement on this issue because that's who we are as a committee. We can have a spirit, and we've had it. And I think that's what's important. That's who we are. That's why we are the greatest country this planet has ever seen. That's why we are the most powerful nation in the world. That's why we've achieved this through democratic values and moral leadership. Uh, and that's also why, at times, we admit to our mistakes. Uh, we have close engagement with our critical allies on our toughest challenges, unparalleled technological and scientific expertise, and by becoming a more tolerant and inclusive society that brings people together from all religions, all races, and all ethnicities. So as I close, the Eagle Act doubles down, I believe, on these strengths, and is about working with allies who share our values to reassert American leadership and ideas as a superior alternative to anything China can offer. So I thank you, and I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. McCall, for his opening remarks. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for your kind words. Uh, just so the members know, we did uh, attempt to engage in good, good faith uh, negotiations uh, on this. And um, while some of, some of what's in this bill is very good, I, I, we got to a point where we just have to agree to disagree. But we always do so with uh, civility uh, and respect, and I think that's been the historic tradition of this committee. Um, and I know the chairman and I are committed to carrying that tradition um, forward. Um, and um, you know, just yesterday we passed a, a slate of bipartisan bills, and we passed probably more than any committee in this Congress already that have been bipartisan. And so um, I want to thank you for that as well uh, and your friendship. And so moving forward, um, you know, we will have a spirited debate, but that's what the Congress is, is all about. And we don't always agree on everything. Um, and so I think this will be, a, I hope, a very, again, very uh, civil discourse and uh, respectful debate on uh, something that really is of paramount impor importance, and that is how uh, you know, our foreign policy when it comes to communist Chinese, Chinese government. Um, I want to start out by just saying, my, you know, my father's generation fought in World War II. Uh, I grew up in the Cold War as did the chairman. Uh, my children lived through 9-11, um, as did most in this room. But I think the greatest challenge for this generation is the Chinese Communist Party. Not the Chinese people, but the Chinese Communist Party. And it's a generational struggle. A serious approach to China threat needs to be coordinated across committees of jurisdiction, just like we did uh, when I chaired the China Task Force. Our task force was a result of six months of work between 11 committees of jurisdiction. It involved 60 engagements with 130 Republicans, Democrats, and nonpartisan leaders. And the final product had more than 400 recommendations and of those legislative recommendations, well over half were bipartisan. Recent Pew, Pew uh, polling finds roughly nine in 10 U.S. adults consider the PRC a competitor or an enemy. In other words, confronting the China problem, the China challenge, is not a Republican 
issue or a Democrat issue, it is an American issue, which is why it should be, we should be here today talking about a bipartisan conference, a bill to confront the challenge posed by the CCP. Instead, I believe the bill we are marking up today uh, was crafted primarily, if not solely, by the majority uh, with little input from committee Republicans. And Republican requests to improve the bill ahead of today's markup were not really given any meaningful consideration. This committee has had a long history of working in a bipartisan manner, as I stated, to address some of the most complicated issues facing the world. So it is regrettable and disappointing that at least today uh, that tradition, uh, perhaps we will carry that forward, but we will have this debate. Um, the Eagle Act, and I respect the views of the chairman on this bill. I know he's put a lot of work into it, but I don't believe it's, it's a strong bill. I believe it's more of a messaging bill that is a Trojan horse for flawed green climate initiatives. More than $10 billion are dedicated to green energy and other climate change related projects in this bill. Eight billion of that goes to a UN slush fund called the Green Climate Fund. The majority says it wants the United States to lead on climate change. And many of us on this side of the aisle agree with that. But under this proposal, the United States would outsource that leadership to this unaccountable UN agency that we have virtually no control over. And what's worse is that some of these initiatives may actually end up helping the CCP while harming U.S. foreign policy interests. The Green Climate Fund has already cut a $100 million check to the CCP to finance climate programs it should be paying for. That will likely happen again if this bill is passed. In other words, some of this money provided by the American taxpayer could end up going directly into the CCP's coffers. Moreover, nothing would prevent the Green Climate Fund from paying for solar panels made in China in the Xinjiang province under the slave labor. And even though forced labor has tainted the PRC's solar panel supply chain, as Secretary Kerry admitted to this committee just a month and a half ago to me, even without the serious concerns I have on the client provisions, the remainder of this bill is underwhelming. Despite being more than 600 pages, this bill offers few new ideas and little substantive actions to reorient our government in this strategic comp competition. Instead, it is filled with findings, reports, and non-binding senses of Congress. It claims to impose costs on the CCP for human rights abuses, but it does so by recycling bills that we've already passed out of our committee and some that have already passed the House. It claims to strengthen American economic diplomacy, but it offers no solutions to the CCP's unfair trade practices and illegal behavior. That includes CCP-controlled companies violating our stock market listing rules. But what's more striking is not what's in it, but what's missing. One of the strongest authorities this committee has across multiple federal agencies is the Export Control Act. Export controls, which are this committee's most powerful tools to slow down the CCP military and prevent human rights abuses, is only mentioned three times in the 600 pages. Then none of these times is, is it, I'm sorry, one of these times is just a definition. So this bill deliberately excludes a Senate provision to increase scrutiny on CCP companies that violate our stock market regulations. With an ongoing genocide and a military-driven economy uh, system, now is not the time to put industry profits ahead of our values and our security. And this bill is so far, so far away from the comprehensive and bipartisan approach the Senate took. When the Senate Foreign Relations Committee passed a very bipartisan package. One Democrat bill for one Republican. Uh, that is not this bill. I was hopeful we could take a lot of what the Senate did, and some of, some of it's in here, 
but we are nowhere near a place where our two chambers can get to a conference report the president could sign. So I urge my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to heed President Biden's CIA director's work, words about China itself. Uh, when the director said, quote, it is hard for me to see a more significant threat or challenge for the United States as far out as I can see into the 21st century than this one. It is the biggest geopolitical test that we face, and I couldn't agree more. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know we agree, uh, disagree on this, but respectfully, and I'm hopeful in the future we can get work together to treat the Chinese Communist Party as the most significant national security threat to the United States as it truly is. Uh, and with that, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Now, I realize that uh, I would assume that many men members wish to speak on the bill and that some members also will have amendments to offer. So I'm going to recognize now members by committee seniority, alternated between Democrats and Republicans for the purpose of speaking on the bill first. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we'll circle back to you. Then we will move on to the amendments. Do any other members wish to speak on this measure? Mr. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman, Representative Brad Sherman of California. Five minutes. We write this bill virtually on the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. The, over the uh, years, China has made some progress for its own people. The day they announced they eliminated malaria. And of course, China is far more self-sufficient. People in China are far better fed than they were in 1949. But of course, the rest of Asia has also made tremendous progress uh, during uh, the last uh, 70 years. China now poses a huge threat to the United States in five different areas. First is their unfair trade practices, which have created the most lopsided trading relationship in the history of mammalian life. And part of that is their uh, treatment of intellectual property. Second, on climate, they have offered only the most paltry, long-term, eventual, we hope you believe us, promises and they're building another coal-fired power plant every couple of weeks. And you know the Chinese plan to operate those plants for their full useful life. We need to change China's uh, activities with regard to greenhouse gases. Third is human rights, whether it's the people of Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, or everyone in China. Uh, and fourth, is China's aggressiveness internationally, militarily, particularly in the South China and East China Seas, particularly their threats to invade or blockade or use missiles against Taiwan, but also uh, their seizure of, asset, of, of islands and the creation of new islands. And finally, as to COVID, uh, I, the, we don't know where this came from, we do know that China has not been forthcoming and that they have silenced and terrified uh, whistleblowers who would want to come forward with information. Uh, we do know that their failure to provide information on a timely basis has cost many tens or hundreds or even possibly millions of lives around the world. And we do know that they continue not to provide information. So it's important that we respond to that, and I believe this bill is just a first step. Ultimately, if we're going to actually change China's behavior, and one would have to bet that we'll be unsuccessful in that, but if we were going to make a real attempt, uh, it would be through tariffs. Even after all the bluster of the Trump administration, the average tariff on Chinese goods is like eight or 9%, which is regarded if you look at all through history of tariffs as a trivial amount. The fact is that uh, their unfair trade practices, their uh, uh, greenhouse gases, their oppression of uh, their own citizens, their military aggression, and uh, their obfuscation with regard to COVID, each one of those would justify 
in themselves a substantial tariff until they change their behavior. Um, as to this bill, I think that uh, it has important provisions in it. I will be offering an amendment to um, add to this bill language, which has already passed the House. Uh, I mean, we've made a few technical improvements here with the uh, help of uh, Republican uh, staff and colleagues uh, to make sure that American companies are not exporting to China technology that they can use uh, to oppress the Uyghurs and other people. Uh, the bill does not have a couple of provisions uh, from the Senate bill, and uh, we should discuss whether we should pass legislation in this area, either as part of this bill or separately. One is uh, Representative McCall's bill on a, uh, a countering Chinese influence fund. I look forward to learning more uh, about the ranking member's view as to how that could be successful. I do strongly support the efforts that we have made uh, for decades to spread democracy uh, throughout Asia and around the world. Uh, and whether this particular bill is another way to do that, I look forward to learning. Uh, second, I know that this bill does, uh, uh, does not contain the Senate provisions on foreign military financing. That is within the jurisdiction of our committee and uh, whether or not the particular Senate provisions are something we want to adopt as part of this bill or separate legislation, uh, we need to be asserting our committee's uh, complete uh, jurisdiction. I guess nothing is complete, uh, as near as complete as can be jurisdiction over foreign military financing. So I look forward to continuing our efforts to be in China. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, over the years, there have been a lot of good left-right coalitions that have formed uh, to combat human rights in China. Uh, I offered my first amendment in, in fighting against human rights abuse in China in 1984. Uh, but really, when we all became much more focused was after the Tiananmen Square massacre. Uh, I was one of those who believed, because I don't think there should be any partisanship whatsoever uh, in these arguments. We're standing with the oppressed, not the oppressor. And when George Herbert Walker Bush went easy on the Chinese Communist Party after Tiananmen Square, I was a very vocal critic. Uh, when Bill Clinton linked human rights with trade in 1993, I and others, including Speaker Nancy Pelosi, couldn't have been more supportive, only to find one year later he delinked it on May 26, 1994, and MFN and human rights were no longer serious and sustained progress in human rights in a whole list of categories that were articulated in his original executive order. It was just shredded on a, late on a Friday afternoon. I did a press conference. Nancy Pelosi did a press conference. And we made clear uh, this is where we think we've just maybe even lost China because we put profits above of human rights, and now we are bearing the very bitter fruit of that all these decades later. We all know that, that Xi Jinping... Uh, has uh, mounted a horrible genocide. All genocides are horrible. Uh, but this one came replete with all kinds of justifications. These weren't slave labor camps. Uh, they were re-education. Uh, they, were, they were training camps, when we know that is absolutely untrue. And, of course, he said in one speech exposed by the New York Times that the weapons of the People's Democratic Dictatorship must be wielded without any hesitation or wavering. Uh, he also said many other things that were revealed uh, that just shows the animosity and the hatred toward the Uyghurs and snuffing out that culture of, of Muslims and the Kazakh minorities as well. Nor is this hatred of religious and ethnic minorities new. It's the same cruel script we have seen in Tibet, where the Chinese Communist Party has sought to erase the culture of a very proud and wonderful people. Xi Jinping and CCP continues to crush democracy and human rights defenders in Hong Kong in violation, in this case, of solemn promises, the basic law, and treaty obligations made with the UK that are international law, and yet they violate them with impunity. They have used unspeakable methods of torture, including the chair, against prisoners of conscience. I've had hearings on it. Unbelievable how they make people suffer. Xi Jinping also imposes unbelievable sanctions against women who carry children who are unauthorized. Forced abortion is pervasive, as well as forced sterilization. And notwithstanding some changes in the child limitation quotas, coercion is still part and parcel of that program. On religious freedom, 
under synodization, there's an effort right now, as we all know, to have all religions, Christian, Muslim, Falun Gong practitioners, all comport uh, to the principles of Xi Jinping's Marxist regime. It's called synodization. Uh, it's got a name. And if you don't, good luck. You're going to the gulag. You're going to have surveillance in your church if you are officially recognized church, which most of them are not. So it's an all-out effort to crush religion. And on human trafficking, they continue to be a tier three country, an egregious violator, uh, because uh, women and forced labor, uh, sex and labor trafficking is rampant. On COVID-19, as we all know, it has killed 26,000 people in my home state of New Jersey, approximately 60,000 dead in the United States, and we still don't know. We have no unfettered access, and sadly, WHO has not been helpful. Matter of fact, they just took the lies uh, that were proffered by Xi Jinping and his people uh, and amplified those. Uh, I have an amendment on that later on and also an amendment on the Olympics and a few other fentanyl that I hope members will consider seriously. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to speak, and I yield back to balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Albio Sirius from New Jersey for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this markup. I fully support your effort to ensure that we maintain the United States global leadership role in the face of a rising China. I would like to speak briefly about the amendment in the nature of a substitute for H.R. 3524, the Eagle Act. As you know, I am very concerned about China's influence in Latin America and the Caribbean, and I believe the best way for us to respond is by deepening our engagement in the Western Hemisphere. The United States' comparative advantage lies in our close partnerships throughout the region and in the deeply rooted people-to-people -people ties that bind us together. As a former teacher, I am proud that we are including Section 251 in this bill as it seeks to expand our education and culture exchange, pro exchange programs in Latin America and the Caribbean. The Young Leaders of the Americas Initiative, our International Visitors Leadership Program, and other exchange programs in Latin America and help build long-lasting connections between aspiring leaders from this region and the United States. I believe we should expand these programs to reach even, even more talented young people. In particular, we should make every effort to reach traditionally underrepresented groups and attract a more diverse pool of applicants. Section 251 will enable us to do just that by directing the Secretary of State to develop a strategy to evaluate and expand our educational exchange programs, ensuring that we take proactive steps to include historically marginalized communities. It also requests a report to Congress with an intelligence assessment on the impact of the Chinese government's activity in Latin America and the Caribbean that aim to manipulate public opinion, including its journalistic exchange programs and its growing network of Confucius Institutes. Building bridges with our partners in the hemisphere is good foreign policy. As we look to deepen U.S. engagement with our closest neighbors, expanding access to our education and cultural exchange programs can be, very, can be a very powerful tool. I want to thank Chairman Meeks and his staff for working with me to include this provision, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Steve Shabbat of Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As ranking member of the Asia-Pacific Subcommittee, I'm convinced that this century will be defined by how we respond to the Chinese Communist Party and its drive towards global hegemony. If we respond effectively, freedom and democracy will continue to prevail and flourish. If we fail, the People's Republic of China will replace the post-World War II order with a new global order that revolves around Beijing, and the world will be far worse off for it. Unfortunately, I cannot support this Eagle Act uh, in its current form today because the legislation fails to fully appreciate the gravity of the threat posed by the CCP and consequently does not rise to meet the challenge that we face. After decades of inaction, we need to reevaluate our basic approach towards engagement with the Chinese government. We need bold legislation that utilizes the full range of our national power 
to ensure that freedom will prevail in a strategic competition with the PRC that we did not start, we do not want, but which we must win. This legislation should have been far bolder and less wasteful than the bill the Senate passed a few weeks ago. Instead, the Eagle Act moves us in the opposite direction, shedding several substantive provisions that the Senate adopted. What's left are bits of substance scattered in a sea of platitudes uh, that's one part rhetoric, one part strategic reports, and one part, a large part, Green New Deal. Unfortunately, strategy reports are like bringing a knife to a gunfight. And this majority seems to believe that climate leadership is more important than meeting the much more urgent threat posed by the PRC. I think the best way to describe this legislation is that it's timid. It's as if the majority is either afraid to admit that the PRC poses a threat or not willing to commit the resources necessary to combat Chinese aggression. But the American people know that China does pose a threat to the U.S., and they have for quite a while. For those who lost their jobs to the PRC's unfair trade practices or currency manipulation or a cyber attack originating in China, the debate we are having today was settled a long time ago. Now is the time to meet the challenge head on, not debate whether it even exists. To be fair, the substitute amendment makes several improvements upon the original bill, especially on Taiwan. And I want to thank the chairman for working with a number of us to include some excellent Taiwan-related provisions in the bill. There are also items on Oceania, uh, legislation on Xinjiang uh, that has already passed the House, and various other provisions that deserve to become law. On the whole, however, the bill fails on its principal objective to stand up to China. Now I'll use the balance of my time to frame the challenge we face from the Chinese Communist Party. For decades since Nixon went to China, the United States has attempted to play nice with the People's Republic of China in hopes that incorporating it into the post-World War II order would push the CCP to become responsible global stakeholders. It's now become clear that those hopes were at best overly optimistic. The communists in Beijing were never interested in joining our system. Instead, they've used our efforts at engagement against us, hiding their strength and biding their time, all while investing heavily in their military and developing strategic initiatives to remake the world in their image. On every front, Beijing is challenging the free world and our premise that open societies, free markets, and the rule of law always result in a prosperous and equitable civilization. This challenge is now obvious, whether we look at the PRC's fundamental disregard for human rights, their rampant theft of intellectual property, their manipulation of the internal tr international trading system, their penchant for secrecy and cover-ups which worsened the COVID-19 pandemic, in some people's minds, we aren't really in a struggle for global ideological supremacy with the CCP. One need look no further than Senator Bernie Sanders' article in Foreign Affairs a couple of weeks ago. Incredibly, he seems to argue that instead of competing with China, we should become more like them, adopting socialist policies across the board. Let, re let me remind the committee that throughout the Cold War, there were those who said the Soviet Union really wasn't all that bad either. In fact, I think one of them was Bernie Sanders while he was honeymooning in Moscow. Well, Bernie was wrong then, and he's wrong again. It's past time that we adopt policies that will win the struggle between Beijing and the free world. This bill, unfortunately, does not do that, Mr. Chairman, which is why I cannot support it today, and I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Jerry Connolly of Virginia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing this very important bill before us. Uh, I, I guess I respectfully disagree with the criticism I've heard on, from my friends on the other side of the aisle. I find it interesting that so little criticism was forthcoming when President Trump clearly weakened the United States position vis-a-vis -vis China and our leadership role in the world when he pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, leaving China in it. Or 
when he ripped up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a trade deal the United States led. And the only country that clearly was the beneficiary of that action was China. JCPOA, walking away from the Iran nuclear agreement. It wasn't China that lost. It was the United States that lost. Where was the criticism about the weakening of the United States leadership then? And the retreat from that leadership directly benefited the People's Republic of China. Here we are, the Eagle Bill, that attempts to create an architecture that's fairly comprehensive that will help guide us as we develop strategies and policies to meet the growing threat from China. We talk a lot about bipartisanship on this committee. Bipartisanship is easy when the issues at hand are fairly straightforward and easy, but it's a lot harder when they're complicated and can divide us. Are we gonna have the will to work to try to strengthen it and make it better and come together? Or are we gonna take pot shots and use it as an example for ideological posturing for various and sundry audiences that might appreciate that? I think this bill is a step forward, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to supporting it. I appreciate a number of provisions you've included. My friend from Ohio mentioned Taiwan. You took the language we had in our bill entirely and incorporated it in this bill. That's not a trivial matter. And I think that's a strong signal to Beijing about what we're about here today. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for bringing this before us. I look forward to the deliberations, and I look forward at the end of the day to supporting our final work product. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Greg Meeks. Under the authoritarian control of the Chinese Communist Party, there was the largest peacetime military buildup by China in world history. This is a threat to American families and our valued allies of the Indo-Pacific region. Additionally, there are widespread human rights abuses occurring against the Uyghur population and repression of anyone who dares to criticize the Chinese Communist Party, as we see in Hong Kong. The time to act with regard to malign activities of the Chinese Communist Party and influence is now. Sadly, the measure before us today is partisan and does not proportionally address the global threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. As the grateful son of a World War II flying tiger of the U.S. Army Air Corps who served in China, I grew up with great appreciation of the people of Xi'an, Chengdu, and Kunming, where he served. First Lieutenant Hugh DeVoe Wilson educated me on the bravery of the Chinese people to resist aggression with their extraordinary cultural heritage. It is because of my devotion to the people of China that I support Ranking Member Mike McCall's amendment to the nature of a substitute, which represents serious framework for countering the Chinese Communist Party by promoting strategic competition, addressing gross violations of human rights, promoting data security, and countering Chinese Communist propaganda. I am disappointed that this was not part of the bipartisan effort. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Karen Bass of California for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for holding this markup. I agree with my colleagues that it's important for us to counter the China narrative across the world, but we also have to engage and strengthen democracy development and help combat pandemics and crises at home and abroad in general. Uh, my comments center on part four of the bill that focuses on Africa. And in that, uh, I want to reference section 271, the uh, assessment of political economy and security activity of the PRC. So I think that we must be honest with ourselves here in Congress. China does have a strong footprint on the continent because we ignored it, frankly, and only saw it as a place for economic gain or for vacations. We should have created exchange programs for African students to teach our ideals, and we should have built hospitals and roads from Cairo to Cape Town, 
and we should have annual or biannual high-level summits to build mutual, long-lasting strategic partnerships. The good news is, is that this administration has made the continent a priority, and it is up to us here in Congress to create and implement a strategic long-term plan that will not only benefit our national security, but will enhance the continent's global standing. We must also engage and build capacity to invest in long-term infrastructure and education in developing nations so that they can be self-sustaining. Protecting the climate is in the interest of U.S. foreign policy. During this Congress, the Africa Subcommittee conducted a hearing on the effects of climate change in Africa, and members learned that poverty, violent extremism, and food insecurity is oftentimes a direct correlation from the often ever-changing climate. That is why I'm encouraged that this bill authorizes funds for the Green Climate Fund, authorizes agency heads to co-finance infrastructure, resilience, and environmental adaptation projects that advance U.S. development objectives overseas and provide viable alternatives to the Belt and Road Initiatives, and allows the DFC to partner with multilateral development finance institutions to combat climate change. The bill aims to reduce the gap by supporting clean energy, resiliency, and environmental changes and natural disaster adaptation investments in developing countries. This Congress, I introduced H.R. 965, the YALI Act of 2021, which passed the House chamber, and I want to thank the chairman and ranking member for allowing my bill to be incorporated into the EGLE Act, ensuring that young people across the continent have the resources and tools they need to become successful is vital to U.S. national security. Along with supporting young people on the continent, I'm glad that this bill highlights the need for increasing competitiveness, that's Section 272, in Africa, and we can do this by supporting the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, extending AGOA to those who need it, and increasing our bilateral agreements with countries who are readily prepared. The need for digital security is tantamount with Russia and China hacking systems globally, but particularly in places with weak infrastructure. Freedom of speech and expression are pillars of democracy, and autocratic regimes cannot continue to use technology in the way of internet blackouts, blackouts and social media boycotts to hamper the voice of the people. I'm glad that this bill in Section 275 offers some oversight of how the U.S. can assist the continent and other developing nations in having a more robust and free media platform. Too many journalists are detained the world over for doing their job of reporting facts. And by boycotting social media and disrupting the internet, too many times the will of the people is not being heard and elections are not free, transparent, and exclusive. I helped work on the Electrify Africa Act uh, in 2015, and it is encouraging that the Eagle Act, Section 276, amends and highlights U.S. public and private sector investment in African energy infrastructure. But we should not go in as overseers. We should go in as long-term strategic partners that can help advance Africa's resources, technology, and expertise. And finally, when it comes to China's involvement uh, in Africa, African leaders, elected officials, and civil societies often say that they would much rather turn to the United States so our commitment to step up our involvement on the continent is as, as well as what we can accomplish in this legislation by us stepping up. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. I now recognize Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Well, as I listen to my good friend from Virginia revise history, I'm heartened to know that even though we have our differences here, we will have a respectful process and fair process under your leadership, Mr. Chairman. To paraphrase commentator Ben Shapiro, this bill is what would happen if the song Imagine took human form and then ate a Tide Pod. It's not only unserious, it actively promotes partnership and cooperation with the Chinese Communist Party, an entity that lied and continues to lie to the world regarding the coronavirus and an institution responsible for the loss of more than 615,000 American lives and trillions of dollars worth of damage to the global economy. This bill fails to hold the CCP responsible in any way, and I can only presume based on the text of this bill that the majority does not view the People's Republic of China as an adversary or even a competitor. Rather, in a manner that would make even Neville Chamberlain blush, the majority stridently believes that America continued to appease 
the single greatest existential threat to our nation's security, an actual existential threat. As most of my colleagues in this room would note, nearly half of the world's solar grade polysilicone, a, a chemical compound commonly used in development of solar panels, is produced in Xinjiang province. On June 23rd, the U.S. Department of Labor, this U.S. Department of Labor, under this administration, added polysilicone from China to its list of goods produced by child labor or forced labor. Now, common sense would dictate that the Congress would avoid authorizing the appropriation of funds for the continued production of polysilicon from China. Yet that's exactly what this bill does. We're going to appropriate money to China. Through an $8 billion down payment to a UN-dominated entity called the Green Climate Fund, an entity that invests significantly in solar panel production, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are telling the American people that they should be perfectly content with subsidizing, subsidizing child labor, forced labor, and genocide. The Democrats' uncritical, unmitigated support of the United Nations is so clearly highlighted in the robust, unqualified advocacy for the Global Climate Fund as the CCP continues to infiltrate and dominate numerous agencies across the United Nations on the eve of the 100th anniversary since the CCP's founding. It's more important now than ever that we confront this evil, murderous regime wherever we can. This grotesque institution killed, this is for context, everybody, this institution has killed uh, one million Chinese citizens in Mao's Chinese land reform movement. They killed 712,000 people in the 1949 campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries. They killed 30 million people during the Great Chinese Famine, a result of disastrous socialist policies. During the time of the Great Chinese Famine, it is estimated that anywhere to two, three, two to three million people were beaten or tortured to death. This is the same, these are the same people today, folks. In 1989, the CCP killed up to 10,000 people for daring to dream for a free and democratic society. Today, the CCP is engaged in an ongoing genocide of millions of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. Quite frankly, this bill, the Eagle Act, grossly undermines the challenge we and the wider world are facing today. This bill is antithetical to American values and interests. We know that this bill is going nowhere, but here we are about to embark on a truly impressive display of just how well the left can waste taxpayer resources to satiate the morally ambivalent architects of this legislation. So let me tell you who they are. In 2017, Greenpeace announced that prioritizing sustainable, sustainability will cement China's legacy as it assumes a larger role on the world stage. Last September, the World Wildlife Foundation said that new aspiration announced by General Secretary Xi reflected China's unwavering support and decisive steps to enhance climate ambition. A couple of years ago, the Natural Resources Defense Council's Barbara Finnamore wrote a sorely misguided book entitled, Will China Save the Planet? No, they will not save the planet. Not only does this legislation further compromise the integrity of our supply chains and augment our dependence on China for energy resources, the very people who are driving the policies inscribed in this, pe in this bill, people on the left politely refer to as climate activists, but who the American people might more accu accurately for refer to as China's useful idiots. They are disseminate their, disseminating their CCP-backed propaganda into the halls in Congress and threatening the United States of America's sovereignty. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Bell Keating of Massachusetts for five minutes. I'd like to thank the chair for holding a markup uh, of this critical piece of legislation. I also want to thank your staff for their tireless efforts in putting together such a comprehensive piece of legislation. Because of their work and under your chairmanship, this vitally important Eagle Act reconfirms America's leadership role around the world while providing the appropriate tools and resources that the United States needs to address critical security issues and challenges. And it effectively responds to Chinese malign behavior. I also want to thank the chair for his cooperation in including three important pieces of legislation that I introduced this year. The legislation includes the Countering Russian and Other Overseas Kleptocracy Act. 
the Crook Act, which provides the United States with the tools we need to address global corruption and was already voted favorably out of the committee in April. Specifically included in this legislation is the ability to establish an anti-corruption action fund to assist governments and non-governmental organizations in their efforts to prevent, investigate, and combat corruption and bribery. Establish an interagency task force to work with U.S. embassies to coordinate assistance efforts, promote good governments, uh, governance in foreign states, and enhance and evaluate the ability of foreign states to combat public corruption. And designate embassy anti-corruption points of contact to support an interagency approach to combat public corruption. Further, the EGLE Act also incorporates the Global Climate Change Diplomacy Act, which I introduced with Representative Capt. This legislation creates climate change officer positions within the Department of State's Foreign Service and requires U.S. missions to develop strategies on addressing climate change. In short, this legislation gives the State Department the resources and personnel they need to effectively and, and efficiently respond to one of our planet's greatest threats, climate change. Finally, the EGLE Act also includes my bill, the Rapid Response and Climate Impacts Act. This language will enhance the U.S. government's capacity to prevent, mitigate, and respond to such events by establishing an interagency climate impact task force that will work with domestic and foreign partners to monitor, plan for, and respond to emerging uh, threats that exacerbate climate change. Lastly, I want to thank you and your staff for working with my team to include additional changes as well. For example, the text now includes Section 234, which calls for an increase in the number of U.S.-sponsored positions at the junior level with international organizations by ensuring that more Americans are able to establish their careers in these international organizations at a junior level. We're ensuring Americans will have the ability to fully influence these organizations in order to maintain America's leadership role on the international stage. I also suggested the addition of Section 255. This section calls for the U.S. government to work with our transatlantic partners to respond to malign Chinese investments, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe through the Belt and Road Initiative. This legislation builds off my work, our committee's work, to support integrated infrastructure and energy diversification across Central and Eastern Europe. In closing, uh, I want to thank Chair Meeks, my colleagues, and all the staff for their work on the EGLE Act and in developing a whole-of-government approach to counter Chinese influence and keep Americans safe for new and emerging challenges. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Adam Kinzinger of Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Later this week, the Chinese Communist Party will celebrate their 100th anniversary. And while this markup is designed to hold the CCP accountable for its crimes and level the playing field, I find myself sitting here hard-pressed to imagine a better birthday gift we can give to the CCP than the partisan political divisions that are on display in this committee today. When I first joined this committee, we lived by the motto that politics ends at the water's edge. We did not bash one, each other, one another while overseas. We did not let partisan politics get in the way of strengthening our nation's foreign policy. That's what makes today's markup so disappointing. What, do we do? what we're doing here today does nothing to advance our national security. Rather, it shows our enemies that our Congress is weak and unable to unite for even its own sake. Do we need to hold the CCP accountable for the COVID-19 pandemic that cost the United States over 600,000 deaths? Absolutely. Do we need to hold the CCP accountable for the damage they're doing to our planet? Of course we do. Do we need to hold the CCP accountable for their complete disregard for human life? Clearly, yes. But this bill should not be primarily about funding green climate initiatives, nor should it be primarily about investigating the origins of COVID-19. As members of Congress, we need to know how to walk and chew gum at the same time to think critically and strategically about difficult issues. As elected leaders, when facing gravely serious threats, we're expected to be bold. We're expected to work through ideological differences. And above all, we're expected to remember that our true enemies and adversaries are abroad and that our primary responsibility is to protect the American people and our interest. Today, we should be considering a well-rounded and strategic bill that holds China accountable for the gambit of their misdeeds, and it should be able 
to garner overwhelming bipartisan support because it should have been conceived in that manner. Instead, we will see amendments that are for messaging, for political hits in a campaign, and for real estate in the news. We will see numerous votes that will either force the other side to vote yes or be concerned about the election. In short, you will see a clear fight among Americans on display and not a fight for Americans. This markup has failed to meet the gravity and seriousness of this occasion. To my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, ask yourself, what are we doing here today? What message does this contentious display send to the American people or to our allies or to Beijing for that matter? Both current and former Secretaries of State and Defense have stated their beliefs that the CCP wants to replace the United States as the global leader. Let that sink in. The CCP has stifled Hong Kong's democracy through mass arrests and online censorship. It threatens military action against our ally, Taiwan, on a near constant basis. It is committing genocide daily. Instead of tackling these issues head on, we're debating legislation that does little to address these misconducts. I wish that we could have all sat down to put together a bipartisan bill in the past. This committee has already shown, always shown the ability to do that. We passed HRS 317 about the genocide. We passed the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act. Yet here we are having partisan fights over how to best confront a nation that we know to be the greatest threat to not only the United States, but to democracy and human dignity around the world. Following this markup, maybe we can work together and look at ways to increase cooperation between allies, improve our supply chains, improve trade and other challenges. Addressing these matters not only protects the United States, but indulges our constituents who actually care about these issues and are fearful about America's diminished leadership role in the world. Unfortunately, what is happening here only signals weakness and an all-consuming focus on the next and past elections. It's time to start being leaders that we were elected to be, willing to make tough decisions for our own security and for our own well-being. I will support the McCall ANS, but I will not be doing much more in the rest of this circus. And once this circus is over, I will be here working and ready to find common ground with anyone willing. Until then, I yield. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative David Cicilline of Rhode Island for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today I speak in favor of H.R. 3524, Ensuring American Global Leadership and Engagement Act. I want to thank you for your leadership, Mr. Chairman, on this important piece of legislation and your commitment to ensure that our nation's engagement with China or any country around the world is rooted in our pledge to recenter human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in American foreign policy. I believe to do so strengthens American national security and American interests abroad, and I believe that the Eagle Act delivers on that pledge. In holding a markup for this legislation, we get, can again shed light on the appalling human rights record of the Chinese government in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and beyond. With the ongoing genocide against the Uyghur population in Xinjiang, and with the crackdown on democracy and the rule of law in Hong Kong, the world has gotten a glimpse of what Chinese leadership in the international system would mean. A rejection of human rights, a commitment to authoritarianism, a silenced press, and the abandonment of the rule of law. In Xinjiang, over a million members of the Uyghur population of Xinjiang have been forced to live in squalor, forced to abandon their beliefs, forced to abandon their children, and forced to work. Many have been tortured, many have died, all have suffered. Policies undertaken in Xinjiang continue to stir the conscience and represent one of the century's most agonizing human rights catastrophes. The Chinese government has unleashed a series of draconian measures that should give anyone pause. They've mandated abortions, they've forcibly sterilized men and women, They've forcibly taken over half a million children from their families and have sent them to re-education centers. They monitor the movements and the online activity of millions, ensuring Uyghurs and other minorities are robbed of their privacy. And they force Uyghurs and other minorities into factories for no pay and with no recourse. We must recognize that the Chinese government built its policy over time. What has happened to the Uyghur population is not born out of spontaneous brutality. It has been a well-planned endeavor designed to extinguish a population China finds undesirable. This is a systemic policy that denies the Uyghurs their humanity, their dignity, and seeks to ultimately deny them of their existence. We must do all we can to ensure that the clarion call of never again reverberates around the globe. The Eagle Act takes many steps to do that by condemning Chinese, China's policy 
and Xinjiang, working to prevent the importation of goods suspected to have emanated from forced labor factories and prioritizes refugee applications from those impacted by human rights abuses in Xinjiang. The Eagle Act also highlights China's suppression of democracy, the rule of law, and freedom in Hong Kong. Millions in Hong Kong have continued the fight for democracy only to be subjected to increased censorship, increased police brutality, and increasingly draconian measures to crush dissent and silence opposition. By preventing the sale of munitions to Hong Kong's police forces, appropriating funds for democracy promotion in Hong Kong, prioritizing applications for protected or refugee status from citizens of Hong Kong, and expressing our sense of support for the people of Hong Kong, the Eagle Act demonstrates this committee's commitment to fostering a democratic future for the people of Hong Kong. Again, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your incredible work and the tireless work of your staff on this very important piece of legislation. We must do all that we can to highlight the gulf between the United States and China on these fundamental issues, and the United States must do all it can to follow through on the promise we've made to the world's most vulnerable. That is how we win the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, it pains me to say that this piece of legislation, H.R. 3524, the Eagle Act, falls woefully short and does not come even close to meeting the urgency of the moment. And I want to take this time to speak on the threat that the Communist Chinese Party poses to our nation and to the world. It is no secret, Mr. Chairman, that COVID-19 originated uh, in Wuhan, China, uh, in all likelihood from a lab, and it's taken over 3.5 million lives across the globe. It's cost the world economy over $3.5 trillion. We've lost more than 900,000 American lives alone during this pandemic, and the CCP is squarely to blame for the hell that our nation and the world have endured over the past year and a half. Moreover, the CCP has been able to influence multiple industries in the United States, from sports and entertainment to academia to the financial sector. The enter entertainment industry is censored by China. The CCP malignly influences our professional sports through the NBA's capitulation to the PRC on grave human rights abuses. 32 universities have contracts with the Confucius Institute headquarters, and multiple U.S. companies have CCP members on their board of directors. Mr. Chairman, it is estimated that the CCP's theft of American intellectual property currently costs us between $225 billion and $600 billion annually. And that's what we know of, and that's coming directly from FBI Director Chris Wray, an organization that I used to work for, the FBI. And that's only what we're aware of. Not only are we allowing them to do this, we are literally paying them to do this. Moreover, China has increased its foreign influence efforts on the U.S. by 500%. Their foreign agent spending rose from over 10 million in 2016 to nearly 64 million last year. We cannot permit this to go on any longer. The CCP's end goal is the following. First, to become the world's economic superpower, then to become the world's military superpower, and then become the world's currency standard, replacing the dollar with the one. And uh, so they can spread their communist, authoritarian, and totalitarian oppressive system across the globe when the world has zero defense mechanisms left. Mr. Chairman, this piece of legislation we are marking up here today does not push any consequences onto the CCP, but rather gives more money to them. If we do not take necessary action, China will continue to use our research, our money, our technology to dominate us entirely. I urge my colleagues here today to think hard about this piece of legislation in front of us. This is not uh, a thoughtful bill. It does not protect the United States from China, and quite frankly, it allows them to gain more power over us and our allies. Um, I want to say that I you know, have great respect for my colleagues on this committee. Uh, I implore this committee, and I implore, implore the chairman, let's not make China a political issue. Our, our nation and our world cannot afford that. There will be plenty of areas for dispute. Uh, we have to remain united on the existential threat that Chinese, Chinese, uh, the Communist Chinese Party poses to the United States and the entire planet. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meeks, for calling this markup on the Eagle Act, an important measure the members of this committee have spent weeks working on. The United States must take seriously competition from China and what it means for the United States' role in the world. 
I've said that our policy towards China should be to engage in competition where necessary and also to invest in our own sources of strength here at home. We must also define what it means for China to quote unquote cheat by strengthening international institutions, international law, and the norms of behavior between and among nations. This bill makes great strides to do just that, and I thank my colleagues, the chairman, and the committee staff for working with me to include a number of important provisions in the bill. I worked, for example, with Representative Sarah Jacobs to strengthen U.S. leadership at the United Nations by paying our dues and placing more American diplomats in international organizations. These are provisions from our Restoring U.S. Leadership Act and International Organizations Act of 2021. I also want to thank Representative Liu and Senator Markey for working with me on including provisions detailing the PRC's export of nuclear technology and ballistic missile technology to the Middle East. The last thing we need is a new arms race in that region, and I've been concerned by reports of Saudi Arabia working with China on nuclear technology. The EGLE Act also contains important provisions I worked with my colleagues Andy Kim, Dean Phillips, and Karen Basson to strengthen the, the Development Finance Corporation by increasing its liability cap and pushing to restore congressional intent in how equity investments are scored by OMB and CBO. And this bill contains the bipartisan Young Southeast Asian Leadership Initiative Act, which I'm proud to have introduced with Representative Claudia Tenney of New York to strengthen people-to-people -people engagement with young people in Southeast Asia. As the founding co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on ASEAN, I'm a strong supporter of strengthening this important regional organization and supporting their efforts to build an ASEAN identity. This bill also includes extensions of the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, a bill that I've led with Senator Ed Markey to strengthen U.S. priorities in the Indo-Pacific and the Indian Ocean Region Strategic Review Act, legislation I introduced to better define U.S. interests in the Indian Ocean Region support the development of regional institutions, and support U.S. allies and partners there. The EGLE Act is a strong measure and creates a blueprint for the United States to engage and compete with China in a range of areas. And I look forward to the ideas my colleagues will be offering and the debate, of course, on the provisions uh, over the course of this markup. With that, I yield back, Chairman. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Brian Mast of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. It was said, we tried. We tried. We tried on this. We didn't try on this. That's the last thing that was done on this piece of legislation was to try. I've seen some of the greatest efforts of America can do attitude. And this definitely wasn't it. This doesn't even come close to measuring up to American can do attitude. There's not even a whiff of it. This committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the United States of America, the most powerful country on the face of this planet, did we sit in rooms all night with pizza, beer, and marker boards behind us, bipartisanly, talking about China stealing uh, the plans for an F-35, or what went on with COVID, or their currency manipulation, or all the things that, that they do over. Did we sit in a room night after night talking about those things and, and how we could debate those things? Didn't happen. Did we sit with our, with our Senate counterparts on their Foreign Relations Committee talking to them about what we will do here and what they will do there to make sure that whatever it is that we come up with gets directly to the president's desk so that we can have real plans of action in place to go out there and combat these threats? Didn't happen, that, that would be an example of trying, that didn't happen. Did we sit with the Pentagon? Did we sit with Quantico? I mean, those would be examples of trying to me. So when I hear, we tried, that's BS. We didn't try at all. And that's disgusting. And if this is the best example that this place can give of American fight, of American trying, of the way that we go out there and combat those that try to come and combat us in all of these different ways, then the people across this country might as well start doing everything that they can to learn Mandarin. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize 
uh, Representative Dina Titus of Nevada for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. You know, we've heard a lot today from the other side of the aisle that this bill is a partisan piece of legislation uh, and that it won't really confront China. And we've tried, but we're not really doing anything. I, I disagree, but I'm afraid that the bluster of the past administration has really blinded those folks on the other side to the reality of what the situation is and how the actions of the Trump administration only weakened the U.S. economy. And as we disengaged from the world and the global community, we alienated our many of our allies and partners who are in that dangerous neighborhood and feeling increased pressure from the People's Republic of China. So let's put this in perspective of how we got here and what little was done to counter it before we took the action of, the, of this bill. You know, the lack of engagement has really allowed China to expand its ever-growing efforts to be the world's dominant power, both economically and politically. And they want to usher in a new global world order that's heavenly influenced by their autocratic nature and systems. Now, since coming into office, the Biden administration has recognized this threat and worked to confront China's increasing aggression. We saw that early on from meetings with the Secretary of State. But we realize you can't do this alone. You have to have partners. And the Eagle Act builds on some of those things that the administration has already done. A couple of things I'd like to point out that I think haven't really been mentioned, but are important in this bill. And one has to do with uh, sustainability and dealing with the environment as we move forward in our relations with China. This is especially true with what's happening in the Mekong River Basin in Southeast Asia. The Mekong River flows from Tibet to the Mekong Delta and crosses six countries and provides vital resources for over 65 million people who live in that Delta. Now, while the Chinese Lanchang Mekong Cooperation Forum, and that's made up of China, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, and Burma, that focuses on infrastructure and hydropower advancements, it really doesn't pay any attention to environmental concerns. So I'm glad that the Eagle Act encourages greater U.S. engagement in the Mekong River Commission that's composed, composed of Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. We want to increase the membership there and promote greater capacity in sustainable conservation and management of natural resources. Um, one thing I'm disappointed that the bill doesn't do, but I understand from working with your staff that there's a jurisdictional problem, is focus on how we can increase opportunities and uh, methods for international travel to get us back to where we were in pre-pandemic levels and assist the U.S. tourism industry. International travel is a vital part of the economy in Southern Nevada, but you don't have to have the fabulous Las Vegas Strip to realize how tourism benefits our economy. And international tourists stay longer and spend more money when they are here. So we'd, I'd like to see us work together and I appreciate your commitment and your staff, Mr. Chairman, to see how we can promote tourism because not only is it good for the economy, but it's a great form of soft power or soft diplomacy as we deal with other countries where we can build good relations to help us stand up to some of China's attempts to spread its influence through the Belt and Road pro process from Sri Lanka to Peru. So I thank the chairman and I look forward to working with you on that. I would point out too that those people who would uh, argue against my comments that this is a just a partisan democratic green issue when we talk about the economy, that the Center of American Progress did a poll in 2021, and it showed that a higher percentage of Americans from both parties believe that combating climate change is a higher priority than going after China. So keep that in perspective as you talk about the problems that this bill has dealing with the environment. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back. And I recognize Representative Andy Barr of Kentucky for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think maybe um, in response to uh, uh, the gentlelady's comments who just spoke, uh, one of the reasons why the American people maybe don't understand uh, the gravity of the threat of the CCP and, and maybe prioritize green efforts is because the, this Congress is not showing leadership in highlighting the seriousness of this problem. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the past 40 years, policymakers from both major political parties have made the critical mistake time and again of uh, believing that engagement with China would induce the communist totalitarian government in Beijing to cooperate with the West on a wide range of policy challenges, implement reforms to open their economy to free trade and free markets, and usher in a new era of political freedoms and democratization, trade, access to U.S. capital markets, and transfer of technology was supposed to lead to a convergence of Chinese and Western interests. But over and over again, the Chinese Communist Party failed to meet our expectations. And as we aided in the rise of China, economically and militarily, the CCP became more and more emboldened. U.S. leaders' engagement strategy often turned a blind eye to the CCP's human rights violations, economic malfeasance, malign foreign investment, theft of intellectual property, forced transfer of technology, expansionist aggression, buildup of, uh, build of its nuclear capabilities, the, the People's Liberation Army, and its Blue Water Navy, which is now the largest in the world, and its many empty promises as well as the CCP's deep commitment to a hostile communist ideology that drives this malign behavior. Over and over, we dismissed this behavior, whether it was the crackdown and slaughter of peaceful protesters in Tiananmen in 1989, China's admission into the WTO in 2000, which enriched the Chinese but failed to force China to conform its behavior to international norms of fair and reciprocal trade, its military buildup in the South China Sea, or China's most, most recent blatant violation of its international treaty on Hong Kong. The result of this accommodation and leniency has been a disaster. In his book, The 100-Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace the United States as the World's Superpower, Michael Pillsbury draws on his decades of experience as a DOD, CIA, and State Department official who had engaged with the hardliners in Beijing. He documented how Chinese culture and literature highlights the role of deception and heroes using cunning to manipulate others, concealing true motives, misleading enemies, feigning weakness while hiding growing strength, and veiling true intentions until the very end. His conclusion is alarming, that China is well on its way to achieving its ultimate objective by 2049, the 100-year anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. But the ultimate wake-up call was last year when the CCP violated an international treaty and dismantled uh, Hong Kong civil liberties, continued its oppression of ethnic minorities, including Uyghurs and Tibetans, dramatically accelerated its military buildup, and conducted increasingly belligerent pro provocations on land, sea, and in cyberspace, violating other nations' sovereignty. Um, and it's continuing and amplifying its debt trap diplomacy th through its One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, the, after months of briefings uh, uh, during the China task force with current and former top administration officials on both sides of the aisle, business executives, ambassadors, diplomats, members of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Commission, think tanks, and various other outside experts, I, along with the 14 other members of the China task force last Congress, representing 11 committees of the U.S. House, issued a report with 82 key findings and more than 400 leaning recommend, forward leaning recommendations across six categories of CCP related challenges. Ideological competition, supply chains, national security, technology, economics, and energy and competitiveness. After all this work, we concluded that the CCP, through its inter internal totalitarian and surveillance state repression, its predatory economic practices, and its increasingly aggressive military posture, with over 1.4 billion people and, the, and a GDP poised to overtake the size of the U.S. economy in just a few short years, represents the greatest existential national economic and security challenge in American history. And so, Mr. Chairman, this is why I'm disappointed. That, that this legislation today does not take the China Task Force recommendations seriously, does not incorporate those recommendations. And so I would say it's one thing to try to reinvent the wheel, but this legislation doesn't even try to do that. It is an entirely different thing and whole, to wholly disregard an entire body of substantive and bipartisan policy work uh, that would more effectively counter CCP aggression. Uh, so that is why I reluctantly oppose the Eagle Act, because it disregards the extensive work and bipartisan work of the China Task Force. And I do applaud the chairman and my Democrat colleagues for addressing the issue. I just wish 
that this legislation would take up this body of work, significant and substantive body of work that the China Task Force, under the leadership of the ranking member of this committee, engaged in extensively during the last Congress. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now, I now uh, yield to Representative Ted Dow Deutsch of Florida, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meeks, for holding this important markup. Uh, in recent years, the People's Republic of China has transformed into the greatest international challenge that the United States faces for America to compete successfully uh, with China, even as uh, we, we work on shared mutual interests like climate change. We must position our nation to excel politically, economically, diplomatically, technologically, and militarily, and leverage our global alliances and our role in, in, in the international multilateral system and the energy and innovation of the American people. Success also requires that we lead with our values. We must call out and impose costs on China for its systematic human rights violations against its own people and for dismantling democracy, a free press, and civil liberties in Hong Kong. Moreover, for years, the PRC government has used false pretexts to repress and discriminate against Turkic Muslims and other minority groups, particularly Uyghurs in Xinjiang uh, and, uh, and in other countries. Reports from Xinjiang describe a systematic program by the PRC government involving the arbitrary detention of an estimated one million Uyghurs, torture, beatings, food deprivation, sexual assault, forced sterilization, and denial of religious, cultural, and linguistic freedoms. The United States has a proud history, Mr. Chairman, of welcoming those, like the Uyghurs, fleeing oppression around the world. Therefore, I'd like to thank the Chairman for including a revised version of my Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act in the Eagle Act. The provisions will help Uyghurs receive priority to refugee status, providing them direct access to the U.S. refugee system and also making it easier for Uyghurs to apply for asylum in the United States. The legislation directs the Secretary of State to prioritize bilateral diplomacy with third countries that host Uyghurs because these states often face diplomatic pressure from the Chinese government to marginalize or deport Uyghurs. Additionally, it encourages international allies and partners of the United States to assist Uyghurs and others fleeing PRC government oppression through similar refugee and asylum opportunities. Mr. Chairman, we introduced this bill of bipartisan support, which demonstrates broad congressional interest in the plight of the Uyghurs, those in China, the United States, and in third countries. This provision is a continuation of the best tradition of US foreign policy and humanitarianism and it upholds America's interests and America's image as a beacon of hope, refuge, and liberty to billions worldwide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Dan Muser of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we all know China poses a significant and growing strategic threat to the United States. This is neither a controversial nor a partisan uh, opinion. In fact, 63% of Americans agree and view China as the most pressing strategic threat to the United States. There is widespread agreement that we must do more to strengthen U.S. leadership and security, counter China, and hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable and engage our allies at the same time to these ends. Legislation that would implement such policies has lately received widespread bipartisan support. Last month, the U.S. Senate passed a comprehensive bill to strengthen the U.S. to counter China with overwhelming bipartisan support. Several House committees are moving bipartisan legislation to the floor that does the same. Yet our committee, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, developed the bill without engaging Republicans. The result is a bill that is heavy on messaging and reporting, but does little to further what, we, what I thought and we all thought would be a shared goal. Uh, this bill has no consequences for China's malign activity, fails to protect critical U.S. assets and industries, and does not properly support our allies in Southeast Asia. While most Americans see China as an adversary, this bill treats them like a partner. Uh, therefore, I, I will be opposing. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Tom Melanowski of New Jersey for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, I'm very pleased to support the EGLE Act uh, today and, and just want to offer a few, uh, a few general words uh, up front. And, and, and I would start with where I think we all agree, and that is that we are engaged right now in a contest of ideas. Um, the United States and China over whether the world should be governed by democratic or authoritarian values. The President recognizes that, Republicans and Democrats in Congress recognize that, and it is good that we have found that consensus because it didn't exist even five or ten years ago. I'm not yet convinced that any of us are really willing to do the politically hard things that are needed to win that contest. Uh, we're all willing to bash China, we're all willing to punish the CCP. Those are the easy things, and often that's what we have to do. Um, the hard things include, for example, a recognition that the United States cannot cede economic leadership in Asia to China. We have to lead and participate in the trading arrangements that link countries across the Pacific, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's been politically harder for some Democrats to recognize. At the same time, a politically hard thing would be to recognize that the United States in this competition has to lead with our values, including the openness of our society, including the fact that we have this extraordinary comparative advantage of allowing and encouraging people from all over the world to come to the United States to immigrate, um, including as refugees. China doesn't have that advantage. They have to rely only on the talents of their native-born population. That's something that has been politically harder for Republicans to recognize. But I do think that in this bill, we have come together, or we can and should come together, around policy measures that will strengthen our side uh, in this contest. And I thank the chairman for working collaboratively to put together a good bill, a bill that is improving, in fact, um, as we speak. There are a lot of good things in this bill that are bipartisan that are not in the Senate bill. The chairman mentioned a few of them. Um, our legislation uh, that makes it easier for persecuted people in Hong Kong to come to the United States and that says to the Chinese Communist Party that if you continue to crush Hong Kong, you will lose its best and brightest entrepreneurs and academics to us. We need to do this, th that in this bill because this provision was blocked in the Senate for some reason by Senator Cruz last December. Um, we are working to add export control language, something that the ranking member mentioned, to make sure that high technology from the United States does not empower uh, Chinese security agencies to persecute Uyghurs and Tibetans and, and others in their country. That is something that did pass the House actually a couple of times in the last Congress but for reasons that I still don't understand, although it was bipartisan in both the House and the Senate, it was blocked by Republicans on the Senate Banking Committee in the last Congress. So I want to get it in this bill so that we can get it to the President to have it signed into law. Um, the area that we probably disagree on the most, and this is okay because it's all right to have principled discussion and debate in this committee rather than just letting staff negotiate the lowest common denominator bill sometimes. Sometimes it's good for us to engage in that kind of debate. And obviously we do disagree about the role that climate policy should play in China legislation and China policy. I'm convinced that it is absolutely central to the contest that we are in with the Chinese Communist Party. Because what Beijing recognizes, what we should recognize, is that the world is moving to clean energy. It's a good thing, it's also an inevitable thing. They want to lead that transition. They want to master and market the technologies that the entire world is going to use to move towards clean energy and away from fossil fuels. I don't want them to win that race. I want the United States to win that race. And yes, part of that requires us to be part of multilateral initiatives like the Paris Accords. It requires us to lead multilateral initiatives out of the United Nations to help developing countries move to clean energy. And that means if we want to lead them, we got to fund them. And that's why this bill appropriately does exactly that. So there's a lot in this bill that ought to unite us. There are some things we're going to disagree on. That's healthy. Let's have a good debate, which will lead to a better bill and advance the cause of democracy in the United States in this competition. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative 
Maria Alvera Salazar of Florida for five minutes. <clears throat> Okay, the gentlelady I understand is on her way. So I now recognize Representative Kathy Manning of North Carolina for five minutes. Representative Manning, could you please unmute? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna start by thanking you for convening this markup. We're here today to discuss legislation that bolsters America's competitiveness and ensures that American workers and businesses are in the best position to compete in the global economy. This bill addresses many important topics that would lead to onshoring of businesses and the creation of American jobs. I'd like to highlight the importance of American manufacturing and reliable supply chains. The current shortages of critical supplies like microchips and semiconductors have demonstrated the critical importance of American manufacturing and reliable supply chains. The extraordinary work of American companies and workers during the pandemic showed us that American manufacturers stand ready to meet the needs of this country. At the beginning of the pandemic, frontline healthcare workers faced shortages and sometimes a frustrating inability to obtain the masks, gowns, and other PPE they needed to keep themselves and their patients safe. In response, the U.S. textile and apparel industry, especially manufacturers in my district, rose to the challenge to retool production lines, retrain workers, and meet the demands for a high quality product at a time when the global supply chains failed us. I visited a manufacturing plant in my district to see firsthand the innovations and hard work that allowed timely production of life-saving PPE. As COVID-19 cases in the United States have stabilized, it's clear that we need to make sure we never again have the lack of PPE we need to keep our people safe. To ensure domestic manufacturers can continue to produce a reliable supply of PPE, the federal government must commit to procuring PPE from American companies. As we consider this important legislation to promote American competitiveness and to onshore manufacturing from China, I will continue to work with the Biden administration and my colleagues to create jobs for Americans that restore critical supply chains. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, Trying to see, are there any other members who would like to speak on this bill? Sorry, I'm still not sure. Hearing none, I'm told that votes on the House floor are imminent. So therefore, the, this committee will go into recess and will resume immediately after the second uh, vote in this series of votes. We are now in recess.
will now continue with our markup. I think where we left off, we were doing opening statements, and I now will yield to the representative uh, Maria Alvera Sanchez Salazar from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Meeks. Always wonderful to see you. Uh, we have a bill before us that is supposed to confront communist China's growing influence, but it does not. It's a failure and a joke. This is not a plan for strategic competition. This is a surrender from the United States Congress. My Democrat colleagues claim to care about Latin America and the welfare of Hispanic people like me, yet with this bill, they are selling Latin America to the communists. There is no mention in this bill of China's predatory debt trapping in Latin America or illegal fishing off the coast of many countries, which constitute a direct threat to Latin America's future. In fact, only 37 out of the 600 pages of this bill are dedicated to combating communist China's influence in Latin America. The Chinese are laughing. Meanwhile, 19 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean participate in the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is China's plan to take over the world, starting with our backyard. In Latin America and the Caribbean, communist China's influence is all over the place. 25 out of 31 countries in the region have infrastructure projects funded by the Chinese. And we know the evil intentions behind these projects. Communist China makes big promises, gets you into debt, and steals your country's most critical infrastructure right after. And let me just give you a few examples, Mr. Chairman. In Ecuador, the China Export Bank gave almost $2 billion to the coca Codo sinclair Dam in the Amazon. China charges a steep 7% interest rate on this loan, which costs Ecuador $125 million in interest every year. That is a lot of money for a developing country. Let's go to Peru. The regime is investing billions and billions of dollars at the port in Chiang which is near Lima. They are plowing ahead with construction despite the protests of the people of the town because of the continuous damage to their homes. But you know, the Chinese are not in the business of respecting people's rights. They are in the business of stealing intellectual property created by others or in the business of stealing physical property under their feet. When the money comes due, what do you think the Chinese will ask for in return? That is when it's getting very ugly for the Latin Americans. Now let me talk about illegal fishing. China leads the world in illegal fishing, and now they are destroying the likelihood of coastal people. Years ago, they overfished their own waters. That is why now they're roaming around the world trying to fish the ocean dry from others. Sources say they have close to one million boats, a fleet which is funded and subsidized by the government. They come to Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and they steal from our neighbors. For example, only last year, in only two months, that fleet logged close to 75,000 hours of fishing in Ecuador's exclusive economic zone. Even worse, around the Galapagos Island, 340 Chinese boats were caught pillaging these sacred islands. By the way, a United Nations World Heritage Site. So this practice is devastating both the environment and the local economies. And where are the environmental advocates? Where are the international groups that care so much about the environment when China is pillaging precious sites like the Galapagos? I have not heard from them. This bill, Mr. Chairman, is not going to keep Latin America safe from domination by the proven long arm of the Chinese government. Instead, it would signal that the United States is not interested in defending its allies and our neighbors in our backyard. However, I will not allow for the communist China to conquer Latin America. I care too much about our neighbors and their struggles, and thousands of the residents live in my district, district number 27 in South Florida. 
That is why I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill. It's too weak on the communist Chinese regime, and I urge my colleagues to work together on a bipartisan bill that prioritizes America's national interest and the welfare of our Latin American neighbors. I yield back. Then the lady yields back. Are there any other members wishing to speak? Hearing none, uh, if there are no further opening statements, <clears throat> Pursuant to notice, the committee will now proceed to the consideration of the bill for amendment. And I recognize myself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will designate the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Meek's amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3524. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section 1, short title, table of contents. Short title. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. Without objection, the substitute will be considered as original text for the purposes of amendment and shall be considered as read and open to amendment at any point. The clerk shall distribute the amendment to, you, to your staff virtually and the hearing room. Let's pause briefly to give all members enough time. A minute. For what purpose is representative <clears throat> from Texas, the ranking member? Well, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk, and I ask for its consideration at this time. Right. The clerk shall distribute the amendment to your staff virtually and the hearing room. Let's pause briefly to give all members enough time to review the amendment. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? The clerk will please report the amendment. <clears throat> McCall, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3524. Page one, strike line one, and all that follows through the end of the bill and insert the following. Without objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. A part of order is reserved. And the ranking member, Mr. McCall, is recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, I'm very concerned with the lack of meaningful actions in the Eagle Act that would actually hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable. And that's why I'm submitting this amendment in the nature of a substitute. This measure builds on the bipartisan Senate-passed Strategic Competition Act, and it strengthens it by adding provisions that implement real consequences for the CCP's malign actions. One of the biggest threats we face is a transfer of American wealth, technology, and data to CCP-controlled companies and their military. As I said in my opening remarks, now is not the time to put profits ahead of American values and our national security. My ANS will mandate all CCP military companies be added to the Commerce Department's entity list. This will ensure American technology will not be transferred to the CCP military without a license. It also includes a framework to work with our partners and allies to cut the CCP off from critical technologies, like semiconductor manufacturing equipment that it uses to threaten our national security and further its human rights abuses in Xinjiang province. We also must stop Americans' sensitive personal data including our genomic and healthcare information from being transferred into CCP's hands or will be, certainly be exploited. So my ANS gets rid of outdated rules that prevent the United States from stopping this personal data from being exported to the PRC. The United States must also confront the CCP's malign behavior on the global stage as well. So my ANS will authorize a countering CCP Malign Influence Fund 
to ensure that our diplomats have the resources they need to get the job done. My INS also improves our ability to counter the Belt and Road Initiative by prioritizing investments and in projects that have the most impact, rather than picking projects based on which ones meet the arbitrary green energy priorities of the Biden administration. It also incentivizes, incentivizes private companies and our allies to work with us to counter the Belt and Road Initiative. We must also address the CP's malign influence projects at the United Nations. For years, they've infiltrated the UN system to push their authoritarian agenda. This ANS will ensure the US is using our leadership to counteract those who are trying to use the UN for their own purposes. In addition, my ANS removes the entire climate title. I had hoped we could address the climate provision in a separate vehicle so we could get a bipartisan product focused on countering the CCP. Confronting the malign actions of the CCP is a generational struggle and an American challenge. And nowhere is that more clear than the CCP's extensive human rights abuses. As we speak, Uyghur Muslims and other religious and ethnic minorities in China are being brutally persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party. More than one million people have been detained in internment camps. There are multiple credible reports these innocent people are being subjected to forced labor, forced sterilization and abortions, torture, family separation, and sexual abuse. Family members have reported uh, disappearances and deaths of loved ones. My substitute language will prohibit imports from the Xinjiang province unless we are certain the products were not produced using slave labor. It also includes targeted sanctions against those who are responsible for the genocide in Xinjiang. And it requires American companies to disclose any engagement they have in China that could contribute to human rights abuses in the region. This is a moral test of our time, and we must not fail. So for those reasons, I urge my colleagues on both sides to support my amendment in the nature of a substitute. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I oppose this amendment. Now, hearing some of the concerns raised by my Republican colleagues about our bill, let me now speak about the ranking members, ANS. It has been suggested that our bill was simply a bunch of old bills. My bill includes some past bills and a host of new ideas. The ranking members, ANS, is mainly a completation of recycled bills, as are many of the minorities' amendments we will consider later today. Old bills that have failed to gain bipartisan support, including bills that have already passed but have not yet been enacted, is how we get them to become law. That's why we're here, isn't it? And as you'll see, there is no shortage of GOP amendments. That's a part of the process of oversight. And I have allowed and am allowing the process to take its course. We're going to be considering close to 100 amendments during this markup. And the vast majority of these are by the minority. I also heard criticism about not including measures from the China Task Force. I was, in fact, surprised that despite having an entire report full of recommendations that was ready last year, I was told by my Republican colleagues that they needed more time. We introduced a bill and engaged in negotiations over the past two months. If our Republican colleagues are serious that China's challenge is an urgent one, then why are we told over and over again that more time is needed even after I tried to delay the markup on two occasions? Now, we do have a legitimate disagreement on the issue of America's economic engagement. You mentioned the need to have export controls in this bill, and I agree that's, that it's an important area to consider. But our policies have to be calibrated in a way that gets us the intended outcome, which the ranking member's bill doesn't do. I want our tech companies to succeed in world markets, and to do that, they have to be able to compete. So I want to get export controls right and carefully target them where we know they would have the right impact on China. 
and not punish our own companies. If people around the world are not using American products, they will turn to Chinese instead, and American jobs will be lost. Endangering American jobs, hampering our companies, and ceding market share to Chinese companies isn't how you win the competition with China. It's, in fact, playing into Xinjiang's hand and Xi's hand. I, also, I was also interested to see that the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the ranking member includes many of the provisions in our bill. So I'm quite surprised to hear that our bill doesn't have teeth when they have many of the same measures in their bill. So I'd welcome a clear explanation of why they think the U.S. leading again on the world stage is weak. The bottom line is the Eagle Act does have teeth on human rights. My friends across the aisle talk about Uyghurs on a daily basis. Well, this bill actually walks the, the talk. It punishes the PRC for forced labor in Xinjiang. It calls what is happening there a genocide and provides a refugee status for those persecuted by the PRC. Similarly, the bill provides Hong Kongers access to TPS and refugee status, and it stipulates a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics and calls for the IOC to delay the games. On Taiwan, the Eagle Act upgrades our diplomacy with Taiwan by directing the State Department to work to rename Turkro, the Taiwan, the Taiwan Representative Office, in the United States. It includes a bipartisan measure by Rep. Berra and Rep. Shabbat to bolster Taiwan's defense and deterrence and our economic ties. We also included a measure by Representative Connolly to boast to boost <laughs> Taiwan's participation in international organizations. None of this is symbolic. All of these efforts will help enhance Taiwan's political, economic, and diplomatic space. On climate, our colleagues keep saying this bill is weak, but then they say this bill is too strong on climate. What's the problem with holding China, the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, accountable on climate? If we want to compete with China, we have to do it across the board, and that includes in the critical field of clean energy and by investing in next generation energy technologies so that we can create jobs here at home and lead the world in this area. This is also what our partners and allies expect of us. They were horrified that we left the Paris Climate Accord. That's Japan, Korea, Australia, Europe, India, and the UK, and the list goes on. So let's be clear. The Republican Party is totally isolated on this issue. Their position diverges from overwhelming scientific consensus, from the will of the American people, and from our allies and partners. The thrust of my bill is that we will win the race with China by working with allies and partners. When, we are, when they are strong, our alliance relationships are a force China cannot match. And that's why this bill focuses on having America lead on the world stage and leverage those relationships to apply pressure on China. And with that, uh, my time has expired. Are there any further debate on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Representative Steve Shabbat. I move strike last word. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. Minutes. As ranking member of the Asia and Pacific Subcommittee, I'd like to offer my support uh, for Ranking Member McCall's uh, excellent substitute amendment. Uh, as I've said uh, before when we were discussing the uh, underlying bill, uh, now is the time for bold action. We are in a strategic competition with People's Republic of China for leadership over the next century. The debate about whether we are in that competition is over, and now is the time to address it with all the tools at our national disposal. Last Congress, the Republican China Task Force, led by Ranking Member McCall, began this process. Unfortunately, while the task force was supposed to be bipartisan, House Democrats pulled out at the last minute. I don't really understand that decision, but the end result is the bill that we're considering today, which doesn't have a lot of substance, was developed pretty much on the fly. Uh, it's Green New Deal heavy. Uh, otherwise, really doesn't do that much, as they say in Mr. McCall's area of the country in Texas, uh, it's all hat, no cattle. Uh, Ranking Member McCall's substitute amendment, on the other hand, is the result of his and his staff's thoughtful work on this issue over several years. 
It includes a number of forward-leaning provisions within this committee's jurisdiction and responsibility. Um, I'd like to highlight just two of those provisions. First, the substitute amendment includes information state craft, excuse me, statecraft provisions uh, to counter the CCP's global propaganda infrastructure. We've historically been pretty weak, unfortunately, on information warfare, and while the PRC employs some questionable strategies, they've been pretty successful in spreading their propaganda across the globe. My staff and I have been looking closely at gray zone competition, that competition uh, in the space between peace and war. The PRC runs circles around us in that space, including the field of information warfare. The maddening thing is, we have the better narrative. We've got the truth on our side, um, but we can't seem to get that message where it needs to go. And we have absolutely got to do better at that, and Ranking Member McCall's legislation takes important steps to fix that. The second thing I wanted to point out, the substitute amendment would curtail the flow of sensitive technologies to China. The CCP's vision for global dominance involves forcing the world to operate on Beijing's terms and creating a world in which China replaces the United States as the foremost economic and military power. To achieve its goal of global hegemony, China wants to dominate technology, big data, quantum computing, semiconductors, artificial intelligence, biomedical innovation. The PRC is determined to supplant the United States as the world leader. We can't let that happen. These are just two of the many provisions in this excellent substitute amendment, so I'd urge my colleagues to vote for it. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? The Representative Young Kim. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the markup facing our committee today is the most consequential one we will face this year. Countering threats from the CCP is an existential concern for our country, and both parties should dedicate our attention and efforts towards preparing America to rise to the challenges posed by revisionism and authoritarianism. I have been pleased to work with many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to protect our interests in competition with China and strengthening our alliances. Over the past year, I've joined many of my friends, both Republican and Democrat, in passing strong bipartisan initiatives focused on these issues. It saddens and frustrates me that Speaker Pelosi and Democratic leadership on this committee are not embracing that spirit today. As others have already said, this bill was drafted behind closed doors by Democrats alone. Our side and our request were never seriously considered by Democratic leadership on this committee. It has made me doubt if Speaker Pelosi even shares the same basic views on how the CCP is a threat to be countered and managed, not a troublesome friend to be condoned or underestimated. The Eagle Act emphasizes speed over substance and is a radical divergence from the national consensus on China. The threats are real, and we must work together seriously to counter them. Many portions of the bipartisan Senate bill were taken out for seemingly no reason. For example, Section 3234 of the Senate bill directing U.S. policy on pressing China to enforce sanctions on North Korea was stripped in its entirety from the Eagle Act. Because of negligence from the CCP and state-owned entities, North Korea has been allowed to skirt UN-imposed sanctions and raise millions through illicit means. Why are we not engaging on this? Does Democratic leadership not care that China is actively helping a rogue nuclear regime evade multilateral pressure so that they can continue abusing and killing their own people and destabilize the region at large? I'm proud to stand by Ranking Member McCall in supporting his ANS to the Eagle Act. This improves on the already bipartisan Senate-passed bill by protecting American innovation and technology, 
holds the CCP accountable for coercion and malign practices towards our businesses and properly supports our Indo-Pacific allies. The world is watching us. Our allies and partners need for us to get this right. Meanwhile, democratic leadership has undermined what could have been a bipartisan and meaningful opportunity to improve on a Senate package that was months in the making. If any of my Democratic colleagues are serious about supporting initiatives that will actually hold the CCP accountable, protect our interests abroad, and represent the consensus of the American people, then I urge you to vote in favor of this ANS. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I move to strike the last word. I support the McCall Amendment in the nature of a substitute. This amendment represents serious legislation on strategic competition with the Chinese Communist Party that should have been a part of the ongoing bipartisan effort with the start of the committee process and not at the end of it. There are significant additions to improve the legislation. The United States Information Statecraft Act to rebuild the counter-propaganda power of the Cold War era United States Information Agency which became defunct after the Berlin Wall fell. A framework to work with partners and allies to cut the CCP off from critical technologies such as semiconductor manufacturing technology that it is using to threaten our national security. These improved export controls work in tandem with allies when we can and alone when we must. Accountability and oversight for the Commerce Department failure to fully implement the Export Control Reform Act, which has been slow to restrict the export of emerging and foundational technologies to the Communist Party. Mandatory designation of the CCP military companies to the Commerce Department entity list, ensuring that technology cannot be transferred without a license. Additionally, mandatory transparency for Congress <clears throat> on dual-use technology transfers to the Communist Party, entities designated as national security threats, scoping the Communist Party discriminatory treatment of foreign firms, and an analysis of U.S. government authorities to enforce economic reciprocity, updating pre-Internet era authorities that prevent the U.S. government from stopping the export of sensitive U.S. personal data to the Communist Party, such as genomic and health data. Tracking financial flows to the Communist Party, including passive investment through index funds, which are larger than ever, despite the CCP threat. Countering the new Communist Party laws designed to coerce companies to violate U.S. export control and sanctions law by releasing control technology to Communist Party companies, improving the Development Finance Agency's ability to counter the Belt and Road Initiative by ensuring equity investments are scored based on a net present value, the United Nations Transparency and Accountability Act to counter CCP efforts to subvert the UN system and ensure that U.S. personnel are represented in UN agencies, and finally advancing the U.S.-Taiwan relationship with the common sense measures, such as allowing Taiwan military personnel to wear the uniforms in the United States and focusing on our high-tech ties, which are so valuable to Taiwan and the United States. I urge adoption of the amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Recognized. Thank you, and I, too, join my colleagues in supporting the McCall Amendment in the nature of a substitute, and um, let me just say that, you know, in contrast to the underlying Eagle Act, uh, uh, I believe that the McCall Amendment uh, provides real consequences for the CCP's malign behavior. Uh, it keeps uh, sensitive American-made technology out of the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, and it properly supports Taiwan and other Indo-Pacific allies. Um, 
you know, the, the framework in the amendment in the nature of a substitute to work with partners and allies to cut the CCP off from critical technologies such as semiconductor manufacturing technology is so important and why I support the ANS. And we have seen our over-dependence on foreign sources of chips. Uh, and, and all we have to do is listen to our uh, auto, ma auto manufacturers and auto dealers in our districts to understand why this should be in any China bill. Uh, accountability for the Commerce Department's failure to fully implement the Export Control Reform Act, uh, restricting the export of emerging and foundational technologies to the PRC. This provision in the McCall Amendment builds upon the bipartisan work of two Congresses ago in the FIRMA legislation where we reformed and updated CFIUS while at the same time modernizing our approach to export controls. Uh, mandatory designation of CCP military companies to the Department of Commerce entity list, ensuring that uh, this critical technology cannot be transferred without a, a license. Uh, this is why the ANS is superior to the underlying Eagle Act. Uh, mandatory transparency for Congress on dual use technology transfers to PRC entities designated as national security threats. Uh, why we're not taking this as seriously in the Eagle Act, I, I do not understand. Updating pre-internet era authorities that prevent the U.S. government from stopping the export of sensitive U.S. personal data to the PRC, such as genomic and health data. Uh, that is holding the Chinese Communist Party accountable. That is actually imposing real consequences on their malign behavior. Uh, tracking financial flows to the PRC, including passive investment through index funds. We need greater visibility in capital flows to uh, uh, the, the PRC uh, in order to know how uh, to respond to that and to respond to the economic warfare uh, of the PRC. We don't need Western capital financing uh, the CCP's military civil fusion. And I'll also echo my friend from South Carolina's uh, 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 emphasis on updating and improving the Development Finance uh, Agency. Uh, we did a lot of good work um, uh, modernizing OPIC and and, and, and recognizing that the development uh, finance agency that we have in the U.S. government can be an important tool in countering China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, that's what this legislation should be focused on, countering China's uh, malign uh, economic warfare and Belt and Road Initiative using our own tools and leveraging uh, the private capital to go in and compete in lesser developed parts of the world. So uh, in sum, I support the McCall Amendment in the nature of the substitute. Uh, because it, it imposes real consequences for the CCP's malign uh, behavior. It protects American-made technology. It responds to the forced transfer of technology and the theft of intellectual property that is uh, so important. And then, uh, obviously, supporting our allies in Taiwan uh, by advancing uh, that relationship uh, with measures such as allowing Taiwan military personnel to wear their uniforms in the United States and focusing on our high-tech ties. I will say a follow-on on this is to urge this administration to take seriously the need to further integrate the Taiwan and, and U.S. economies uh, by pursuing a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan. I think that would send a powerful signal uh, that we will defend our friends in Taiwan. And with that, I er encourage all of my colleagues to support the amendment in the nature of substitute, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, who seeks recognition. Representative uh, Musa, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Recognize for five minutes. I support the McCall Amendment. As China's influence grows worldwide, and it's very often malign activity threatens more of our assets and our allies, it is imperative that U.S. policy toward uh, China be equally encompassing. The bill before us today, however, fails to counter China where they pose increasing threats to the U.S., but as well, human interests. Ranking Member McCall's proposed amendment is strong on China and does so with bipartisan policies that have support in the House and Senate and that achieve four pillars of a sound China policy. First, securing U.S. assets and institutions by controlling exports of sensitive technology and information, tracking financial flows, and reviewing Chinese gifts to American universities. Engaging, uh, secondly, engaging our allies through enhanced cooperation in the Indo-Pacific uh, to counter China's growing military capacities in the region. Uh, third, holding the Chinese Communist Party accountable 
by addressing China's discrimination against foreign firms and policies to coerce technology transfers. All of this is occurring. And fourth, in addressing China's intolerable human rights abuses by imposing sa sanctions for forced labor, forced abortions, forced uh, sterilization, uh, and at the same time being very supportive in an unambiguous manner uh, for Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Tibet. The ranking members ANS would put the U.S. on a path that protects our interests and strengthens our leadership abroad while challenging China's most egregious offenses against the U.S., neighboring countries, and their own people. I urge support for this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Anyone else seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Hearing no further. Yes. Mr. Chairman, this is Mr. Connolly. Mr. Connolly, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. Con uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I, I can't help but intervene because to listen to my friends on the other side, oh, you would apparently think that but for the alternative amendment being considered, offered by the distinguished ranking member, apparently our committee wants to do nothing with respect to China. Uh, let's not deter their malign behavior. Let's not try to address uh, a host of issues that plague us in the relationship. Let's not seek to constrain China. Let's not seek to counter and compete with China in things like One Belt, One Road, uh, and their att attempts at encroachment and dominance in the South China Sea, etc. And it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chairman, but I thought you uh, went through the rather robust measures that are contained in the bill you have tabled for the committee's consideration. And they're fairly comprehensive and, as, and, and, and robust. Uh, people, for example, have uh, touted Taiwanese soldiers could wear their uniform in the United States, like somehow that's going to that's going to uh, guarantee the status and uh, autonomous status uh, in the in the uh, Taiwan Strait. I mean, you've incorporated two bills, whole and entire, that do a lot more for Taiwan than wearing a uniform, um, in, including promoting Taiwan's participation and right to participate in multilateral international organizations where China has blocked their membership and participation. And, uh, and, and not only would Taiwan benefit from that, the world would uh, in international health forums and other, uh, other venues where Taiwan's technology and intellectual prowess would really make a difference. So I, I, I guess I just wanted to react to that because I, I just think that there's been a, a gross overstatement of what uh, is in front of us as the substitute and a deliberate um, uh, belittling or diminishment of what in fact you've tabled as the bill for our consideration, the Eagle Act. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that, Mr. Chairman. Would a gentleman yield? Would a gentleman yield? I believe he said yes, of course. So let me just get this straight from what, I, what I'm hearing from my colleagues. Number one, it seems to me that my Republican friends want to just continue the failed policies of the prior administration. What is that? America alone. America by itself. That's not leadership. That's not diplomacy. What the Eagle Act does is talks about working with our allies so that we collectively can contain China. You do this America alone, it is be exactly what took place over the last four years. It creates the cracks for China to increase its diplomatic relationships with others around the world because America left the table. You can't lead anybody by yourself. You lead by engaging our allies and having others follow you. And that's exactly what the Eagle Act does. You lead by making sure that we are boosting our economy. So as I said earlier, we need to look at uh, 
ex the export controls, but we need to look at it in a smart way, not handicapping our businesses. We're talking about creating American jobs, not losing American jobs. We always talk about build it in America and sell it else, everywhere else in the world. And that's what the Export Act, that's how you control, that's how you deal with China. We stand up for who we are. When we're talking about our allies and our friends and individuals in Hong Kong and Taiwan, that's what the Eagle Act does. So let's not go back to the failed policies of the last four years that I'm hearing my Republican colleagues talking about. Let's be not America alone, not America first, in the sense that Donald Trump was talking about, but let's go America forward. And I yield back the time. Does anyone else seek recognition? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on the amendment ANS offered by Ranking Member McCall. We're going to take a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. 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 They see you. <laughs> and the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I request a recorded vote. A roll call vote is requested. Pursuant to committee rule 4A2, further proceedings on the amendment shall be postponed. For what purposes of the rep represent the ranking member seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk, McCall number one at the desk, and I ask for its consideration at this time. The clerk shall distribute the amendment to your staff virtually and the in here in the hearing room. Let's pause briefly to give all members enough time to review the amendment. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? The clerk will please report the amendment. McCall number one, amendment to the amendment in the nature of the substitute to H.R. 3524. At the appropriate place, insert the following. Without objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. A point of order is reserved. And Ranking Member McCall is recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this pandemic has wreaked havoc on the world and killed nearly 4 million people globally, 600,000 Americans, and has cost us well over $10 trillion. Uh, my amendment's based on a, a bill introduced by my colleagues, Representative Gallagher and Senator Rubio. It would simply prohibit research funding to the PRC and would implement sanctions until the PRC allows an independent team of international scientists to review the files and experiments at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It would also prohibit federal funding for any joint research between the United States-based researchers and those in the PRC. 
It prohibits federal funding from being used to do gain of function research with the PRC or genetic manipulation. It levies asset and visa sanctions on the Chinese Academy of Scientists, researchers, and their families and associates. Until the PRC is willing to open up the WIV to inspection and be transparent, we may never know the cause and we may not be able to stop it from happening again. And the American taxpayer should never be forced to continue to help pay for their irresponsible experimentation that has caused so much damage throughout the globe. Oh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize myself. I oppose this amendment. Like the ranking member, I want to get to the bottom to what happened and how this pandemic came about. It is clear at the very least the Chinese government has obstructed access to necessary individuals and facilities which will help us to get to the bottom of the pandemic's origin. That said, I trust our national security agencies, which the president has tasked to investigate this issue, to do their job. And I'm certainly open to targeted sanctions against the officials who have obstructed an open and complete investigation into the origins of COVID-19. But unfortunately, this amendment would go far beyond that and would sanction people like whistleblowers who alerted the world to the outbreak in Wuhan. For this amendment, I offered to accept the amendment despite its shortcomings so long as a national security waiver was added. I think a standard waiver to protect American national security would make a lot of sense. As a result, I will oppose this amendment. I yield back my time. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilson, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I move to strike the last word. Five minutes. And uh, as we consider this issue of identification of the uh, virus, the Wuhan virus, uh, I made a uh, one-minute speech uh, May the 15th last year. And I wish that, um, Mr. Chairman, that uh, speeches that I made a year previously I could still refer to and uh, actually be correct. And uh, indeed, uh, what I stated then was correct, and it relates directly to where we are today. And that is um, why we need to investigate the Wuhan virus, because we know this in naming the Wuhan virus, the actual location of origination. It underscores American sympathy for the initial Chinese victims. It highlights the wet market or the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It recognizes whistleblower Dr. Li Wenlang. It praises the bravery of whistle provider Dr. Ai Fen. It honors Chinese doctors. It questions the disappearance of Chinese doctors. It raises issues of untrue denial of person-to-person -person transmission. It causes the World Health Organization to clarify misinformation. It confirms a global catastrophe, not President Trump's fault. It puts on notice biased American mainstream media. It must tell the truth. And indeed, uh, I was really grateful uh, two weeks ago uh, yesterday, uh, the New York Times, uh, for the first time on the front page, identified that very likely, or could be, uh, that uh, it was a uh, lab leak. Additionally, in what I have to, uh, from last year, it puts on notice uh, and alerts uh, the sadness of the illness of the Trump derangement syndrome, where the president had been blamed for everything. Uh, it verifies local and national radio talk show hosts that are Paul Revere's of truth. It underscores President Trump's early decisions to block travel to China. It clarifies uh, people of Italy not being responsible, debunks fake news of U.S. military conspiracy, refutes ignorant smears of untrue European virus. It promotes that Taiwan should have World Health Organization admission. It reveals the World Health Organization complicit with the Chinese Communist Party. The American Enterprise Institute is correct. The Communist Party and U.S. media are gullible. 
Senator Tom Cotton is fully vindicated on China as a pariah state. China project of Congresswoman Liz Cheney documents deception and fraud. 18 state attorney generals have demanded the truth on the Wuhan virus, and I'm really grateful that one of the attorney generals is Alan Wilson of South Carolina. And finally, Turning Point USA's video is accurate. China lied, people died. For many substantive reasons, it's important to correctly investigate the Wuhan virus. It's not to condemn the innocent people of China, but to serve as a message to authoritarians not to conceal their incompetence as billions of people are at risk in over 200 countries with illness, death, and economic destruction. And with that, I urge adoption of the ranking member's amendment, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. One seeks recognition. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman, I, I think this is an outstanding amendment, and I hope members on both sides of the aisle will support it. Uh, this seeks to end a cover-up that has hindered, right from the very beginning, the ability to find out where this happened, why it happened, uh, whether wittingly or unwittingly, the World Health Organization became part of the malign influence of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and Xi Jinping pretty much told uh, Director General Tedros what to say and how to say it, uh, especially in the beginning. And that med meant more people died, including in your state and mine, because we were so highly impacted uh, in New York and New Jersey. Uh, and it seems to me that the sanctions that are prescribed in this bill, which we have already put in uh, to the um, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2000, uh, are very modest indeed. Uh, I mean, we're talking about the imposition of sanctions, personal sanctions, uh, asset blocking, and uh, inadmissible, inadmissibility of visas. Uh, when you juxtapose that with a, a horrific, horrific loss of life, uh, as I said earlier, 26,000 in my own state of New Jersey have died. I know many of the widows and widowers and those who have, uh, have suffered uh, immense pain. Uh, it seems to me this is the least we can be doing, and again, I applaud the chair, my ranking member for his amendment, uh, and also the whole idea of chain of function, uh, to, to make sure that we're not complicit with Chinese scientists on something that exacerbated what was already uh, 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 work that was going on uh, to make a, a, uh, a disease far more communicable uh, and deadly as they did with chain of function. By definition, that's what they're seeking to do. So, you know, the, the stonewalling must end, the cover-up must end. Uh, this is, I think, again, a very modest effort, a very good effort to try to say, let's get to the bottom of it, let there be real um, uh, sanctions imposed on those who are involved. Uh, let's prohibit uh, federal funding for any joint research between U.S.-based researchers and those in the PRC. And finally, I'll just say for context, uh, when, when uh, anthrax hit here in Washington, uh, and when it also hit my post office in Hamilton Township, New Jersey, causing cutaneous anthrax uh, sickness on several people, killed people at, at Brentwood right nearby at the post office, uh, that came out of a lab. It came out of a very nefarious individual who, who did terrible things uh, to unleash it. Well, we're talking about some of the most deadliest uh, potential pathogens uh, that could lead to even another um, a terrible debacle like we've had with COVID-19. So I think this is a very modest amendment. Uh, it's an effective amendment, and I applaud the gentleman for offering it. Mr. Chairman, you're back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cicilline. Move to strike the last word. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I rise in opposition to the amendment. And I just want to underscore what the chairman of the full committee just said. And that is, of course, we are committed to a, a full investigation. And the President of the United States has ordered a full investigation of Chinese culpability with respect to the origins of this virus, quite different from the ex-president who praised President Xi for his excellent uh, transparency in the early stages of this pandemic. Uh, but, but sanctions, if they're to work, need to be targeted. They need to be directed at the right individuals or set of individuals. And I think prior to the conclusion of the review being conducted by our national security agencies, who I, I too have tremendous confidence in, that this uh, amendment would in fact impose sanctions on whistleblowers, despite my 
friend Mr. Wilson's suggestion to the contrary, there is no exception in this amendment for whistleblowers. And in fact, it broadly sweeps 100 affiliated institutes and laboratories, 13 uh, local branches and two universities, without any showing that they had anything to do with impeding uh, the investigation. So I think the chairman is right. If we're going to do sanctions, there ought to be a national security exemption. They should be narrowly drawn. But most importantly, we ought to wait until the review that the president has directed his national security agency to conduct is completed. And so I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. And I yield back to the chairman if he seeks any additional time. Chairman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. Recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I almost, in a way, can't believe that we're debating this. Um, this. This is a great amendment by the ranking member to prohibit research funding to the Communist Party of China. The Communist Party of China. I, I mean, it, it's, it's almost stunning that, that we have to discuss this and that we're banting about whether they should be sanctioned or not. I already went through their history, and we're living in their history right now. It's happening right now. We, we, we walk around this place and we say never again. It's happening right now, and, and never again apparently doesn't mean anything. We could actually do something right now if we adopted this amendment. I mean, the, the American people don't want their tax dollars spent on gain-of-function research by a, by a country that calls the United States its enemy. They don't want that. And, and, and the fact that we're arguing and discussing that, it, it belies reason, quite honestly. Um, levying visa sanctions on the Chinese Academy of Scientists, researchers, and their families and associates, I, I would just challenge anybody in the room and anybody across the country to tell me how many American students are studying scientific research in China and speaking and studying that in Mandarin? And then juxtapose that with how many Chinese students are studying in the United States of America and speaking English, in many cases, better than American citizens. It is time for us, it is long past time for the United States of America to have some reciprocity and some respect in the world vis-a-vis -vis the country that calls the United States of America its enemy. There's absolutely no reason we shouldn't adopt this amendment and I urge passage, and I yield back the balance. Gentleman yields back. Anyone else seeks recognition? Hearing no further request to speak. Yes, Mr. Muser. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Connolly. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, take um, it for five minutes. Thank you. You know, listen to my friends on the other side of the aisle. Apparently, uh, this issue is whether we support China or oppose China. And apparently there's some massive attempt to finance R&D in China, to, uh, uh, to shore up their scientific infrastructure at our expense. And of course, that's a straw man. That isn't true. The reference to uh, the virus and tied to the Wuhan name has done enormous destruction to the Asian American community in America, and they'll tell you that. Those kinds of malign references don't help anything or anyone. And frankly, without defending China at all, we have an investigation with our intelligence community underway. Let's let that work and see what they find. The, the, uh, the idea that uh, we're somehow promoting or supporting or propping up uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese research and development infrastructure is, is simply false. It's a strong man. And uh, the amendment uh, invoking the meme of the Trump years is going to do harm to the Asian American community all over again. And I might add, final point, to listen to my friends when they get so fulsome about criticizing China as one should. They conveniently forget all of the mistakes and incompetence and destruction that was caused by President Trump and his maladministration of this pandemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we're going to have investigations and if we're going to point fingers, we ought to be looking at that, too, with the same fulsomeness that we're approaching China. 
I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Musa. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about today, we're talking about an important amendment that seems to make sense to a lot of people, yet there are some that are talking about uh, the past administration, and yet we're here now working on correcting a, a devastating situation that after 15 months, we've lost 600,000 American lives. Uh, you know, we, we've got this opportunity now. Also, my colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle fail to recognize that the sanctions do exempt intelligence and law enforcement. Well thought out, it's specific. So, and, and it will be useful, very, very useful. So, after all this time, we still don't have any answer on where the virus came from. We can all agree to that. Unfortunately, we have reason to believe, a lot of evidence to support, that it may have that it originated in Wuhan at a lab. Uh, what's worse, this very lab, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, may have been receiving U.S. taxpayer funding. The, the WHO, World Health Organization, has proven itself untrustworthy. Um, one could say maybe the least, uh, and there is mounting evidence that it's been complicit in China's deliberate misinformation, uh, particularly in, in the early days of this pandemic. So what is needed now is an independent investigation which China has, no, has so far unequivocally refused. The McCall Amendment is a common sense policy that prohibits research funding for China and sanctions Chinese researchers until an independent investigation takes place. The United States must lead an effort to place international pressure on China to provide answers on this virus that have affected every part of the world, spared none. I urge support for this amendment. There is no reason not to. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Barr, last word. Recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you. I just, uh, just very briefly want to directly respond to the uh, the claims from the gentleman from Virginia uh, that the previous administration engaged in maladministration with respect to the response to the, to the pandemic. And, and let's drill down specifically on the, the, the previous administration's response to the NIH and gain-of-function research and the Wuhan Institute of Virology, because here are the facts. The facts are that the NIH did, in fact, fund the non-governmental organization EcoHealth Alliance. The EcoHealth Alliance provided $600,000 to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, $133, that was broken up in $133,000 a year, except when President Trump identified this as a potential problem and terminated that grant. So the, the, my friends on the other side of the aisle claiming that the Trump administration messed up, what they're talking about is the Trump administration canceling a grant that went from the NIH to EcoHealth Alliance that resulted in the Wuhan Institute of Virology for gain-of-function research, and let me make this other point, when two scientists from the U.S. Embassy two years ago went to visit the Wuhan Institute of Virology and saw the gain-of-function research and witnessed it, they were so alarmed, they sent two sensitive cables back to the State Department warning this could cause a global pandemic. We should applaud and thank the Trump administration from canceling NIH grant funding that went to this non-governmental organization that ended up in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I certainly am. But what I don't understand is why we are not now voting for the amendment offered by the ranking member, which, which says that we all stand against any U.S. taxpayer dollars going to gain a function research until there is an independent team of international scientists to review the experiments at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So with that, the facts just do not back up uh, the claims of the gentleman uh, from Virginia, and, and I urge my colleagues to support this COVID origins sanctions amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Malinowski.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. Recognize for five minutes. Uh, I, I'll, I just want to make two points. Number one, China is not the Chinese Communist Party. The reason why we make this distinction, the reason why a lot of uh, very intelligent people in the last administration, including Mike Pompeo um, and, and many other officials, insisted on using the phrase Chinese Communist Party is so that we distinguish the leadership of China from the Chinese people, Chinese society, and other Chinese institutions that should be and could be our allies in this contest. Um, and so to, to, to begin a, a process of sanctioning basically the Chinese medical and academic and research establishment as if that is the Chinese Communist Party, I think is a tremendous mistake and utterly um, ignorant of the lessons of the Cold War when we encouraged contacts with the academic community, with the intellectual community, with the scientific community of the former Soviet Union, which included many people who were whistleblowers and dissidents, great men and women like Andrei Sakharov, rather than simply equating them with the Russian Communist Party. What a mistake that would have been. Number two, you don't sanction people before an investigation is complete. I can't think of any example in American diplomatic history where we said we are going to impose punitive sanctions on individuals pending an investigation that might determine whether some of them are or are not accountable for a crime. I'm, I'm all in on holding individuals in China accountable for being responsible for this virus if there is an investigation which demonstrates that they are. We are open-minded on our side about this, including on whether the lab in Wuhan was the source of this virus. Our Republican colleagues are jumping the gun right now. They're so determined to act on their theory, unproven as of yet, that certain people were responsible. They want us to impose sanctions before the investigation is done. That would be completely irresponsible. Wait for it to get done, then come back to us, and we'll talk about accountability that is in keeping with the facts. Thank you, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Chair. Mr. Phillips. I move to strike the last word. Recognized for five minutes. And I'd like to yield my time to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Connolly, you're recognized. I thank, I thank my good friend and thank him for yielding. Um, I, you know, I, uh, the comments made in the other side of the aisle uh, about we ought to thank the Trump administration for what it did uh, requires massive amounts of amnesia. You mean we should thank Donald Trump and his administration for publicly praising Xi Jinping in the beginning of the pandemic for their management of the virus? You mean we ought to thank Donald Trump for publicly as president using his public platform to suggest maybe the use of disinfectant, the ingestion of disinfectants might cure the virus, he didn't know. Um, you mean we ought to thank Donald Trump and his administration for the suppression of science, for the politicization at the CDC and the NIH, for the demonization of Dr. Fauci, the preeminent virologist and, and, and uh, infectious disease specialist in the United States government. I mean, you're holding him to no account at all, and you want us to believe that all of this is due to Chinese behavior. But the United States administration under Donald Trump contributed mightily to the deteriorating situation and the bad management of this virus that cost lives. And that's, in, that's on his watch, and we're not going to forget it. I thank my friend for yielding. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on amendment number one re by Representative McCall. We're going to take a vote by voice. Will all members please unmute your microphones? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Oh, no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it.
and the amendment is not Mr. agreed Mr. to. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Now, I request a recorded vote. A roll call vote is requested. Pursuant to committee rule 4A2, further proceedings on the amendment shall be postponed. Uh. Mr. Chairman? Who seeks recognition? Uh, this is Sherman. I have uh, an amendment, actually two amendments and at the desk. Let me say before I recognize Mr. Sherman that I want to uh, say a word about the process as we begin this, prep, uh, this function. I'm going to recognize members for up to three amendments, one at a time, so that we can get through this process quicker. Uh, and I'll alternate between minority and majority. Uh, and then we'll go back after you do three, though, for those who have more than three amendments in which they're offering. Uh, so, I now, the, I now recognize Mr. Mr. Sherman have an amendment at the desk. The clerk shall distribute the amendment to offer your staff, to offer the staff virtually and here in the hearing room. Mr. Chair, which amendment is Mr. Sherman bringing up first? Uh, the first one will be the one that's subtitled Critical Capacities to Enable Human Rights Abuses. Is that amendment number 36? Or 39? I believe it's uh, number 30, I can't uh, read that, 39. Amendment number 39. Please distribute the amendment. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? The clerk, please report the amendment. Chairman number 39, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3524. At the appropriate place- Without objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. A point of order is reserved. And Representative Sherman is now recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. We have just had a discussion that was somewhat partisan. Uh, the two amendments that I have here uh, simply reflect language that has been adopted on the floor of the House of Representatives unanimously, on, in some cases on several uh, occasions. Uh, hopefully these amendments will be non-controversial and will not require a uh, recorded vote. The first of these deals with the export of technologies that the uh, uh, Communist Party of China can use to oppress its own people, particularly focused on uh, the Uyghurs. Uh, under the banner Strike Hard, the Chinese Communist Party has not only put a million people in, quote, re-education camps, some would say concentration camps, uh, but also the Strike Hard campaign has involved high-tech uh, surveillance and monitoring of Uyghurs uh, a, in an effort to suppress uh, Muslim religious practice. Uh, the, and so the uh, amendment is designed to prevent the export by the United States of technologies that would facilitate that kind of oppression. I first introduced this language in 2019 with the introduction of HR 1025, the Uyghur Act, this was a bipartisan bill, and I want to thank uh, Representatives uh, Yoho, Conley, and Wagner for joining me in introducing that bill. On a bipartisan basis, uh, this language has uh, passed the House. Uh, the first was when the House of Representatives included my language uh, when, as an amendment uh, to the Senate's bill, S-178, also called the Uyghur Act, uh, which was authored by uh, the bipartisan team of Senators Rubio and Menendez. We passed this same language again, slightly uh, uh, with slight technical improvements. Uh, when they, it was offered by Representative Malinowski, 
as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act. So we've done it twice on the floor of the House without, uh, uh, without controversy. Uh, this uh, uh, amendment today reflects the export control, uh, uh, also re uh, reflects the Export Control Provisions Act found in the Senate bill um, in uh, section 5211. That is of course the bill that is parallel to the House bill we're considering today um, that passed the Senate Foreign Affairs uh, uh, or Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, the amendment will require the U.S. government to conduct an internet agency review of items uh, that would supposedly be used by the Chinese government for foreign control. It would include uh, capacities to enable abuses involving censorship, surveillance, monitoring, restriction uh, of the internet, identification of indiv individuals through uh, facial or voice recognition, and DNA sequencing. The amendment also establishes that it is U.S. policy to work with other countries to prevent them from exporting technologies of this repressive nature to the People's Republic of China. I ask that my colleagues uh, support this amendment just as it has been uh, supported recently in the Senate and uh, supported twice unanimously on the floor of the House. I yield back. Who, see, who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCall. Well, I think we finally hit a, a point of bipartisanship. That, that's, that's the good news. I want to thank Mr. Sherman for introducing this amendment. Um, we, as the gentleman said, we passed this uh, on the floor previously, and um, it really goes to my amendment in the nature of a substitute, the bringing up the lack of any export control language, which is really uh, the stick, if you will, the, the carrot is incentivizing good behavior, and the, the stick is the Export Control Act, um, and um, it again demonstrates the lack of any Export Control Act language. I think this would would add that to this bill, um, and particularly uh, on an issue of such importance of human rights as we look at the suppression of the Uyghur Muslim population. So, uh, let me just say, Mr. Chairman, I am. Uh, I support this amendment, um, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? So I recognize myself for five minutes. I think that the goal here for all of us is to try to make sure that we save and American jobs, which is tremendously important. That's the focus of how we compete with China ultimately, by making sure that we open up access to the Chinese markets and be denied, not being denied access there. Again, it's about making it in America and selling it everywhere. That's the key. And we don't want to fall part to some of the same Chinese policies where they're trying to close their markets and our markets are open to them. So we have to be sure, as we move forward, that the creation of American jobs, that we work collectively to make that happen, is indeed the focus of us on this committee in a bipartisan way. So we're working and looking at the exports and making sure that we do so in a smart and intelligent way so that collectively when we are looking at competing with China 
when we're looking at fixing our economies and working with our allies, that we are best in leading these allies and helping in building our economy. So as I look at the Eagle Act and look at trying to develop ideas and provisions uh, that we're moving forward with the export controls and working together, as I indicated earlier, I think that uh, export controls is very important and needs to be included. Let's make sure we do it smartly. And we've got to try to make sure that in doing that, we're not harming ourselves, we're not harming our allies, we're not harming the economy that we have, and we're working collectively to get it done in that manner. And uh, as a result, we will continue, as I said, and I listened, and I'm appreciative of the fact that on this particular amendment, Mr. McCall has indicated that we can work together and try to figure it out. Uh, and I also want to bring to our attention the fact that in moving forward with our private industry, that we're creating and making sure that we're not handcuffing them, that their opportunities are there for them to make sure that they have the, the ability to access the Chinese markets. And that's what we're looking to do. And that's why it's important that we have this debate. That's why I want to make sure that the debate is open to hear and to move forward with regards to everyone, to all members that are on this committee. Let me also refer us to the reason why economic diplomacy and statecraft is important. And what we're looking to do is to increase the exports of advanced technologies and good services, which cause on the administration and others to negotiate digital trade agreements and bolster U.S. economic engagement with key partners like ASEAN and enhance transparency around all U.S. financial markets and boost U.S. assistance and financing with alternatives to China. My time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Malinowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, just to just to speak on on the um, the, the intent of, of this amendment and the reason why we're trying to strike this appropriate balance on our economic engagement uh, with with China. No, nobody is saying that uh, American companies shouldn't be allowed to export goods and services to China. At least not at this stage in uh, in our fraught relationship with that country. Um, but we are concerned that some of the biggest names in U.S. technology have over the last few years been caught providing components and financing and know-how to uh, China's uh, surveillance industry. We all know what life is like, particularly for uh, Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, but also Tibetans and, and frankly, people all over the country, where every single move they make online and increasingly every single move they make in the physical world is monitored by an increasingly sophisticated surveillance 
network. China is mastering the technology of modern totalitarianism. And um, if that's not bad enough, the, the fact that, uh, that, that major companies like Intel and Hewlett Packard uh, and others have been providing components to that system is something that ought to trouble us a great deal, especially when you think, when you consider that, that China is increasingly employing its sophisticated surveillance network not just within its own frontiers, but against critics of the Chinese government living overseas, including in the United States. Um, and so I think what we are trying to do here uh, in a bipartisan way, what we tried to do before, uh, successfully in the House, twice as Mr. Sherman mentioned, is to impose reasonable restrictions on the export of technology that could be used to commit significant human rights violations. Um, that is a sensible thing to do. It is an addition to this bill that makes it stronger. It is an addition that if accepted by the Senate, and I hope would be accepted by the Senate, will make the eventual China bill that I think we're all going to come together on at the end of this process that much stronger. So uh, I thank you for considering it. Thank Mr. McCall for raising this issue earlier in the process. I'm glad this is something that, uh, that we can agree on, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. The committee will go into recess for 10 minutes.
You can count down from five and gap. Markup will resume. Are there any further requests to speak? The question, hearing no further re requests to speak, the question is on the amendment number 39 offered by Representative Sherman. We're going to take a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the amendment is agreed to. No. OK. It, it's agreed to. It's agreed to? Yeah. Yeah. A little surprising. Mr. Chair, I have a uh, second amendment at the desk. The clerk should distribute the amendment. Mr. Chair, uh, what can oh. Mr. Sherman repeat the number, please? What's I do not have the uh, number in front of me, but it's the uh, draft uh, uh, Eagle Act regarding Chinese companies' report requirements. Number 36, Amendment 36. I, I believe it's number 36. Correct. 36. Clerk should distribute the amendment. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? The clerk will please report the amendment. Sherman number 36, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3524. Page 76. Without objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. A point of order is reserved. And Representative Sherman is now recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you. Uh, I speak as chair of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, co-chair of the Bipartisan CPA Caucus, and the only member of our committee who finds uh, that reading uh, auditing uh, uh, procedures and uh, counting principles uh, is a fun recreational activity. Uh, this amendment is designed to uh, uh, support uh, the bill that was passed uh, last year, uh, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board registered, uh, well, it's called the, Hold, uh, the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. And it is in support of the efforts of the Public uh, Company Accounting Oversight Board. Um, this uh, act, which was adopted in December of last year, was put forward by Senator Kennedy in the uh, Senate, Sherman in the House, and was signed by President Trump. I don't think you can cover the ideological um, landscape um, any more fully than that. Uh, what it's designed to do is to help uh, the public uh, company, the uh, public uh, uh, company accounting oversight board to negotiate a system where uh, Chinese companies uh, and their auditors agree to cooperate with the oversight that the PCAOB provides uh, for uh, all of the accounting uh, uh, and financial statements that are distributed uh, for public securities in this country. Uh, when, uh, America, when you have securities 
sold on an American stock exchange, investors should have the protections first of an audit, and then second, to have the PCAOB audit the auditors. Unfortunately, China, apparently Belgium, uh, have prevented the PCAOB from looking at the audit work papers. So this is not an attempt to take Chinese companies off our exchanges or put them at a disadvantage in seeking American capital. Others might argue for that, but that's not what this amendment does, or that's not what the bill uh, did. It simply says that the same investor protections that we have for all the other companies, British, Canadian, and American on our exchanges, would uh, apply uh, to uh, Chinese companies that are listed. The uh, underlying bill put forward by our chairman uh, calls for a, uh, a report that would review all of the issues involved with Chinese companies uh, um, being listed in the United States, uh, their own benefits, their own detriments, I look forward to reading the report. But uh, what this amendment does is it says one thing you don't have to focus on is uh, the uh, uh, bill passed overwhelmingly uh, by both uh, the House and the Senate, uh, the uh, Holding Foreign Companies Accounting uh, Accountability Act. The reason that that's important is that we're not trying to delist these Chinese companies. We're trying to give the PCAOB the negotiating power it needs to get access to the information that it needs. And if we were to pass a uh, bill today that could be interpreted as undercutting that, as saying that we're reevaluating that, um, then uh, I don't think the negotiations would go well. So what this amendment does is it's uh, it in effect says that uh, the public uh, company accountability um, provisions that we passed uh, as an amendment to Sarbanes Oxley are not being focused on this report, not being subject to uh, perhaps uh, reevaluation. I look forward not to the list of Chinese companies. I look forward to those companies complying with what, as I said, every American, British, Canadian, whatever company complies with. And I think this is necessary to protect American investors, to make sure that they don't just get audited financial statements, but that the audit is subject to audit. And uh, with that, I hope uh, that we can pass this simply. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, I'm happy to support this amendment by Mr. Chairman. In December, Congress signed into law new requirements that will force Chinese companies to comply with our security laws. For too long, Chinese regulators have not allowed Chinese companies to comply with basic American audit, auditing pro provisions. This unique shortcoming fails to safeguard American investors, and as a result, there have been a number of notable cases of fraud from PRC companies listed in the United States. So I'm happy to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, uh, once again, um, I, I stand in support of uh, Sermon 36. Um, again, this is where we can be bipartisan. Uh, this was actually in the um, Senate bill, and the, uh, for whatever reason, uh, it was stripped out of the Senate bill in the underlying text of this bill. So I'm really glad that Mr. Sherman has, is actually making the bill just a little bit better. Um, they will increase the scrutiny of Chinese companies violating U.S. security laws. And when a company violates U.S. SEC disclosure laws, their investors should know that. And it really makes no sense to deprive the American investor of important information about companies operating illegally on our stock markets. American markets are stronger because we have transparency and rule of law. It's time to stop apologizing for PRC companies that are breaking those laws. So with that, I, I support this amendment, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Anyone else seeking recognition? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on the amendment number 36 offered by Mr. Sherman. We're gonna take a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 
All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Thank you. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I ask that amendment number one uh, be brought before the committee. Moving the Genocide Olympics to a different city and country. Uh, without objection, the reading of the amendment is this. Well, The clerk shall distribute the amendment. Just so it's clear, this is Smith number one. Correct. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? Will the clerk please report the amendment? Smith number one, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3524. Add at the end of the Without following. objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with, <clears throat> and a point of order is reserved, and Representative Smith is now recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, in the early 1990s, when China was seeking to host the 2000 Olympic Games, I traveled to Beijing to meet the father of the democracy world movement, Wei Jing Shang, who had been released from prison to help the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, of course, to persuade the IOC, International Olympic Committee, to select Beijing for the 2000 Games. After the PRC was denied the Games, he was promptly rearrested and tortured almost to death before eventually being released and allowed to come to the United States on humanitarian parole. China was eventually awarded the Olympics eight years later in 2008 over the rigorous protests of me and many others. So immediately prior to the beginning of those games, Congressman Frank Wolf and I traveled to Beijing to raise the issue of human rights and highlight the fact that the Chinese Communist Party was actually arresting human rights defenders and democracy uh, promoters in and around Beijing to prevent any contact with journalists. Fast forward, no lessons learned, unfortunately. Uh, now we have the 2022 Olympics, and back in, in 2015, at the same time that Xi Jinping was planning uh, and orchestrating the genocide against the Muslim Uyghurs, at the exact same time, his people were telling the IOC Evaluation Committee that they were going to be good on human rights and you know have no fear, no worry. Uh, we, we have asked the IOC exactly what promises were made, still haven't gotten them. I chaired a hearing on the 18th of May as co-chairman of the Lantos Human Rights Commission and heard from very, very great witnesses um, from Human Rights Watch on uh, who really made a strong case as to why we ought to be moving the Olympics to a different venue, a different city uh, in a different country. Matter of fact, Samuel Chu, the managing director of Hong Kong Human Rights Council said, Hosting the Olympics have become a go-to proven solution for authoritarian regimes to whitewash their crimes, boost their image internationally, and strengthen alliances. And worse, China used the 2008 Olympics as a catalyst for expanding its security and surveillance apparatus. He pointed out that the World Anti-Doping Agency banned Russia from playing and hosting all major sporting events for four years, including the Olympics, for doping. And yet when a country commits crimes against humanity, when they absolutely are doing what they're doing to the Hong Kongers, to people throughout all of China, and now with special vehemence and hatred against the Muslims in, in Xinjiang, 
uh, a genocide that both this administration and the previous administration have so identified. This is like the 1936 Olympics with the, with the uh, Nazis hosting them, and this simply calls on the president to craft a plan of action to engage with the International Olympics Committee to secure a change in venue for the 2022 Olympics in Beijing. It can be done if there is a will by the international community, and I think we have to insist upon it, uh, to think that Xi Jinping will be welcoming people, welcoming the athletes, while simultaneously he is butchering the people of Xinjiang, Xinjiang uh, is, is unconscionable. So I do hope the committee will adopt the amendment and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now I recognize myself for five minutes. You know, I've been clear on this issue. And I was proud to co-sponsor with Ranking Member McCall and other members a resolution urging the IOC to find an alternative venue for the 2022 Olympics. The Eagle Act text also speaks clearly on this issue in Section 316 of the ANS. So we need real action from the IOC and in concert with our allies to push back on the Chinese government's egregious human rights abuses. The problem that I have with this uh, amendment is that it is redundant. It is redundant to what we have in Section 316 of the INS, and as a result, I oppose this amendment. I yield back my time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shabbat. Uh, move to strike the last word. Recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I support Mr. Smith's amendment because it would uh, strengthen the underlying legislation's provisions uh, with respect to the 2022 Beijing Olympics. Beijing is actively engaged in any number of human rights abuses, as we all know. Uh, whether we look at the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, Tibet, the Falun Gong, Christians, the list goes on and on. Beijing should not be given the opportunity to project its soft power while it's committing genocide, Mr. Smith's common sense amendment tasks the president with figuring out how we change the location of the 2022 Olympics so we aren't faced with the choice of whether or not we should boycott them, because that obviously would adversely impact an awful lot of American athletes. And I think we want to, uh, I think we all want to avoid that if at all possible. So I support this amendment, and I would now yield the balance of my time. Uh, to Mr. Smith. I thank my good friend for yielding, and with great respect for the chairman, I'm glad you have language in the bill. I've read it very carefully. Uh, it does call for a diplomatic boycott. While my amendment does not speak to a diplomatic boycott, I do believe there ought to be an all-out boycott if it, there is no venue change. Uh, but the rest of it is sense of the Congress. This is uh, would require a strategy by the administration uh, with a date certain, date certain, uh, to, again, get an action plan, a strategy to try to get a change of venue. I think we need to up our game, uh, both as a, an executive branch and, and legislative branch, to say we're not kidding. You can't have a genocide Olympics. Uh, and, and we you know, say we're totally against it, which we are, uh, but it's going to happen unless there is a change of venue. And let's not forget that when the Olympic Committee voted on this, uh, several of the countries pulled out, and I wonder whether or not that was under pressure by the Chinese Communist Party. They do that extraordinarily well. Uh, but Kazakhstan stayed in it, and they got 40 votes. The PRC got 44. They didn't win by much, showing that there was. I have tried without an ability to get an answer. I've asked CRS, Congressional Research Service, and others, well, how did the U.S. vote? Did we vote for China or did we vote for Kazakhstan? I still can't get that information. So we really need to get to the bottom of this. And I think an action plan, another major step, good step, I think what makes it not likely but hopefully probable that we can get this. You know, you never know, but I think we got to try. Because, again, when I see our athletes parading into, into Beijing, and Xi Jinping was asked. We had a Congressional Research Service a woman, uh, an expert, Suzanne Lawrence, testify at our hearing. She said, here's what Xi Jinping has said his reasons are for having the Olympics. It's not about the athletes. It's not about competition. I love athletic competition. Uh, he said it's about showcasing to the world uh, the governance model of the PRC. Chinese communism, uh, about selling their brands, their businesses, so that they make more money, which then could be used for nefarious persons. So uh, reasons, I should say. So I do ask you 
uh, and members of the committee to give this their support. It's a strategy, and I think it could be part of a solution. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Malinowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, number one, I can't agree more with um, my, uh, my colleague, Representative Smith, about the objective here, which was that we should, th these games should not be held uh, in China for all the reasons, the good reasons that he stated. Um, but I do have a couple of concerns. One is that the bill already says the games shouldn't be held in China, um, in addition to the diplomatic boycott. But, good friend would yield. Of it's course, a sense yes. of the Congress. This calls for a strategy that would do that. And I, I think understand. And, and so here, and this, and, and this may, um, well, l let, me, let me just tell you from the standpoint of my State Department experience what effect this will have, because you rightly point out that the one substantive addition that your amendment adds is this uh, requirement for a strategy in a report. Um, what, what will happen when this arrives uh, at uh, a desk at the State Department is that uh, the, the lawyers will immediately advise the secretary that Congress cannot direct them to pursue a diplomatic objective, which has always been the viewpoint of every administration. And a desk officer in the East Asia Bureau will be assigned the task of writing a report and will spend a few days uh, drafting and clearing with about 92 people a report that won't say very much and that few of us will read when, and I'd probably rather have that person actually working on the diplomacy than on writing a report. This is a broader subject that I, I think we need to debate a little bit more as a committee, Mr. Chairman. Um, all of us uh, are, uh, have written legislation, myself included, that essentially requires the State Department to produce reports to us. There are thousands upon thousands of reports that they owe to us after years and years of this kind of legislation, some of which are absolutely necessary and important. But I think we should always pause when we, when we consider that legislative strategy, whether we are actually achieving an important objective or simply requiring uh, junior staff at the State Department to actually take time away from the diplomacy that we want them to be engaging in order to, um, to write these reports for us. So it, it is the substantive addition, but I just, I don't think it'll have the object, uh, the, 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 the effect that, uh, that my friend um, seeks. Um, and we all do seek that effect, which is uh, an effort to try to move the games. I yield back, thank you. Gentleman yields back. Anyone else seek recognition? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on amendment number one offered by Mr. Smith. Uh, we're going to take a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. And chair, the amendment. I do ask for a recorded vote. Recorded vote. Uh, has been requested and pursuant to committee rule 4A2, further proceedings on the amendment shall be postponed. Chairman, I have another Who seeks amendment. Another amendment. Mr. Smith. An amendment number 30, uh, the special envoy for Xinjiang. Clerk should distribute the amendment. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? Clerk, please report the amendment. 
Smith, number 30, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3524. At the appropriate Without place, objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. An report of order is reserved. Representative Smith is now recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this is a very simple amendment, but I think it could have a, a positive impact on the effort uh, to bring additional focus on the ongoing genocide in Xinjiang province. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there has been, uh, I didn't mention it earlier, but we've all talked about it, so many people, one to three million people, who have been put into uh, uh, gulags. Uh, the use of forced abortion and forced sterilization is widespread, and the population uh, in violation of, of the Genocide Convention, one of the five pillars of it, uh, they are literally trying to uh, devastate the population by killing the children, and they're also taking the children who are born uh, and putting them into orphanages and with Han Chinese uh, to take away their, their special culture uh, of being Muslims and uh, Uyghurs. This idea of a special envoy is one that many of us have supported on so many important causes throughout the years. Our own Bob King, uh, who was uh, uh, on the Democrat side staffer, uh, did a great job as the special envoy for uh, North Korea. Uh, Senator Danforth, certainly when he was a special envoy for Sudan, uh, he's the reason the Comprehensive Peace Agreement came into being, because he got all the factions together. Uh, in like manner, uh, Senator Mitchell did it with uh, uh, Northern Ireland when he was special envoy. Uh, and there's just, we had great special envoys for Darfur, and it was hard to get those special envoys. Administrations usually push back. Uh, they say we've got enough people in place. Sometimes that's true, but that special focus that could be given uh, by a special envoy can make a difference. And, you know, there are also other things this special envoy could be doing. Many of the Muslim countries around the world have not been as effective or as robust in their efforts to, to stand with their co-religionists in Xinjiang, and they ought to be. I raise it all the time when I meet with uh, Muslim uh, diplomats. Please speak out to Xi Jinping. You probably won't see him, but talk to his diplomats and let him know, stop the genocide against the Muslim Uyghurs. So I do hope, at your request, Mr. Chairman, we change shall to should. Uh, so we're not saying you absolutely have to do it, Mr. President, but we think you should. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. I support this amendment. Given the severity of the PRC's atrocities, in Xinjiang, I believe this is warranted. The amendment authorizes a special envoy responsible for coordination in the Department on Human Rights and other pressing issues specific to Xinjiang. The special envoy role would help foster greater coordination and focus on this region of concern, and the amendment en enables the department to dual hat and swiftly fill the position from the current department workforce. This bill strengthens, this amendment strengthens the bill, which is already the strongest bill on protecting Uyghurs in this, in this Congress. And I yield back the balance of my time. Anyone seeking recognition? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on the amendment number 30. Amendment number 30. We're going to take a, voice, a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Who seeks recognition? I have an additional amendment, and I thank you. This would be amendment number 31, and I thank you for your support on the last one. Clerk shall distribute the amendment. Have everyone received the copy of the amendment? The clerk will please report the amendment. 
Smith, number 31, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3524 at the appropriate place. Without objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with and a point of order reserved. And Mr. Smith is recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this amendment uh, really uh, adds to existing language that is in uh, the bill, Section 214. Uh, by, by identifying individual people in the PRC and the Chinese government involved in the production of fentanyl and its trafficking into the United States. As chair of the, former chair of the Global Health, Global Human Rights Africa Subcommittee, uh, I chaired a hearing joined by my good friend and colleague, uh, Karen Bass, uh, in September of 2018. And we had uh, the deputy chair of the Office of Global Enforcement at Justice. We had the people from INL there. Uh, and a number of other people, including from the RAND Corporation. And Paul Kierneman, uh, the Deputy Chief of Global Enforcement and Justice, said a kilogram of fentanyl from China can be purchased for less than $5,000, and potential profits from <coughs> that one kilogram yields roughly $1.5 million. He said it's cheap to make, hard to detect, and dangerously uh, potent, and so is it ever. In all of our congressional districts, and I've met many uh, family members who have lost loved ones to fentanyl, including a friend uh, and two opioids, but also fentanyl. And the estimate is in 2019 alone, there were approximately 37,000 people who died from fentanyl overdose. Um, six days ago, the Associated Press uh, did a piece, uh, a very incisive piece, and pointed out that the COVID-19 pandemic intensified America's opioid addiction, including fentanyl, in every corner, but especially in black neighborhoods, uh, and they suffered more acutely. They pointed out uh, in the article, for example, in St. Louis, in the first six months of 2020, deaths increased 64% among black people. This is their quote from the same period the year before, and 40% among uh, white people. And, and throughout the article, and Ashley Amos tend to be a part of the record because it's so incisive, it points out uh, that problem uh, of, of disproportionality. Uh, it is so easily to get, uh, and very often other drugs, particularly heroin, uh, can be laced with it, uh, making an unsuspecting buyer uh, more prone to what happens with fentanyl, which is often death. So I, I would ask, again, this is a, you know, I'm the one who wrote the Belarus Democracy Act, as you know, Mr. Chairman, in 2004, it was the first effort, it's the law of the land, uh, that said we will individually go after abusers, whether it be a president like Lukashenko in Belarus or a lot of people around them so they cannot do anything economically in the United States and they, they are denied visas. That then morphed into the Magnitsky Act. Uh, which I worked on very hard, and it was a totally bipartisan product. Uh, and then Global Magnitsky, which I was the House sponsor of uh, when that became uh, law. And we did that, as you know, through uh, adding it to a, a larger bill. Uh, but it is the law. Individuals, naming names, helps us to do a better job, I believe, uh, to say so-and-so. You know, and, and, and it incentivizes finding them and then personally sanctioning them, hopefully, uh, as we go through this process. We've got to stop fentanyl. It's destroying. Uh, so many people in this country. I yield. Gentleman yields back, and I recognize myself for five minutes. I have to oppose uh, this amendment because it's overly broad. Each person would be too difficult and onerous to do. More problematically, this is unnecessary broad in its scope. And to try to identify each individual person involved in production among the world's largest population is simply uh, too cumbersome a task that has little justification. This would become a full-time job for the agency and distract from the real issue at hand. Now, I know, and I agree with you, Mr. Smith, that this is an important issue, which is why we have a report on the subject in our bill. And I'm happy to work with you uh, in the future to tweak this and make the scope more workable. But the scope as is, I must oppose this bill. I'm also a strong supporter of the Fentanyl Results Act, uh, a bill we passed through this committee in April. The bill calls on the State Department to prioritize combating synthetic drug trafficking in addition to producing a recent a, a report that lays out a strategy on how the U.S. can work with international partners around the world to address this issue. But uh, unfortunately, at this time, I have to oppose this amendment. 
Anyone seek recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shabbat. Move to strike last word. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I represent uh, Southwest Ohio and the opioid epidemic in the greater Cincinnati area, and this is the case all over the country, has been an absolute scourge uh, in, in a whole lot of areas, including our, our area. Um, most of the fentanyl that's uh, causing the opioid overdoses uh, that's been plaguing our country comes from China. You know, oftentimes it goes through Mexico, uh, through the southern border, and this administration's policies uh, that have led uh, to the crisis at that border are also leading to those fentanyl products coming up and killing Americans uh, through that particular border here, too. Um, we need to get a handle on, on this problem, both problems, the southern border problem as well as the fentanyl problem that's killing so many uh, Americans. Uh, China has said that it will work with us uh, to address this issue, uh, but the results, let's face it, speak for themselves. Opioid deaths continue uh, to, to devastate uh, communities all over the country. One way to improve uh, the situation um, is to go after people uh, in China who are sending the fentanyl here. Mr. Smith's amendment uh, would accelerate that process of identifying and holding them accountable. So I uh, hope my colleagues would support uh, this very uh, helpful uh, amendment, uh, well written and uh, common sense. And I can't yeah. imagine why anybody would vote against it. And I would be happy to yield to John. I thank my good friend for yielding and thank you for his comments. And I would just say to my distinguished chairman that just like the Magnitsky Act, we don't get everybody who commits egregious, universally recognized human rights violations. But by requiring that we be looking for them and compiling names, and same thing with things like the Leahy Amendment, um, you know, to make sure that we don't train people who are who are um, human rights abusers. Uh, uh, we don't get everybody, we don't find everybody, but we incentivize and by looking for those people, come up with lists. The list may be small at first, may grow, but again, it sends a message that you know, if you want to do business here, uh, if you want a visa to come here. Uh, I think we should be doing even more, like prosecuting them, but we don't have that kind of jurisdiction. Uh, I, I think this is, you know, a very modest way of saying, we, you know, we, we want to hold these people to account. Uh, and as my good friend from Ohio just said, almost all of this is coming from China. Uh, there was a little bit, tiny bit, that came through Latvia, and that always uh, baffled me as to what that was all about. Uh, it often comes through Mexico, but it is coming out of China. And, uh, you know, some of the statements that I've had a hearing that I had, uh, and, and again, my good friend Karen Bass was there. Um, some of the statements that we have from Chinese officials, you know, it's almost like, good luck, it's your drug problem, we don't care. I mean, it was, you know, that's a, that's a paraphrase, but that's in essence what they were saying. Um, so there's a, a malign um, view uh, as to what they're doing here. They're killing Americans. And I don't for a moment think that they care. Uh, if there's a sanction, if there's a penalty phase for what they're doing, they're more likely to uh, uh, say, okay, you know, let's, let's change that. That's how dictatorships are. And the people who are doing this, uh, I just look at, they have a problem with methamphetamines in, in the People's Republic of China. Huge problem. Uh, indigenous problem. They are going after that like you can't believe. They don't have a fentanyl problem. <laughs> so, you know, when they have a will, they can do it. It is a police state. And our hope is that they would shut this down as well for the sake of our young people especially. I reclaim my time and I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize uh, Representative David Cincellini. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be brief. Uh, and I, I recognize the intention of this amendment and I think all of us and all of the communities we represent have suffered as a consequence of fentanyl and um, the resulting deaths and, and, and tremendous harms in our community. I just don't know how this would be operationalized because it requires the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury to identify each person in the country um, involved in this, and I'm not exactly sure how they would have that information. So it seems to Mr. Malinowski's earlier point, just a report that may just be impossible to collect. I, I think the other issue that we have to be conscious of, and there doesn't seem to be an exemption here, is. You know, there are law enforcement agencies, presumably, who are investigating international drug trafficking, and the last thing I think we would want to do is undermine that investigation by having 
them report to Congress the names of people who may be the subject of their question. investigation. So I, I do appreciate Sure, that. of course. I thank you for yielding. Uh, we do have a classified annex uh, in, in the amendment. So, you know, for the, out of an abundance of caution that we don't compromise anything, um, they can send us the information <clears throat> in the classified fashion. I th I'll yield the balance of my time to Mr. Malinowski. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just very quickly, the Magnitsky Act is, very, is, is written in a very different way. Uh, it does not require the Secretary of State or Treasury to send us a list of every human rights violator in the world. Um, it, it authorizes the secretaries to sanction uh, people guilty of very serious human rights abuses in countries around the world. Um, had we written it, and I helped write the Magnitsky Act, had we written it in this broadly expansive way, it would have been impossible to implement and we would have ended up with an ineffectual law as against the very effective law that Congress imposed rightly on the administration many years ago. Um, I, I would, because I recognize, I think we all recognize the seriousness of this issue, I, I'd love to, to work uh, uh, with you, Representative Smith, on, on, on a way that I, I think would make this more effective. I think it would be very useful to get a, a mapping from the administration, from the intelligence community, from Treasury, of how these networks operate, and those in China who, who, uh, who have truly responsible roles. Um, not just some guy who's working on the assembly line of the fentanyl plant, but the people who are actually responsible for this. I'd love to have a network map of that. Um, but I think if it were more limited and therefore more realistic, it would be more effective. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Anyone seeks recognition? Ms. Spanberger. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to echo the comments of my colleagues, Mr. Cicilline and Mr. Um, Malinowski, um, I agree in, in with so much of, of what my colleague from New Jersey said uh, related to wanting to hold people to account, relating to really establishing that if people want to come to the United States and do business here, that we have the responsibility and the right to ensure that those who may be coming um, are not in, in engaged to any degree um, in the trafficking of, of fentanyl. Uh, my community is impacted, as are so many communities across the country. Um, but I, I do echo the, the comments of my colleagues that while I agree completely with the intent, uh, the, op the way this would be operationalized, the way that this would actually function, um, I, leave me with more questions than, than a level of certainty that it would be actually something that could be put into uh, effect. And so um, I join my colleague, Mr. Malinowski, in um, wanting to work with you, Mr. Smith, uh, moving forward to really set firm boundaries, but but do it in a way that, that we know it will actually be utilized. Uh, I yield back. General lady yields back. Anyone seeks recognition? Hearing no further request to speak, the question is on amendment number 30, offered by Mr. Smith. We're going to take a vote by voice. Mr. Chair. Uh, this was amendment number 31. 31? It is 31. 31. Thank you. Amendment number 31, offered by Mr. Smith. We're going to take a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. 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 Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested and pursuant to Rule 4A2, further proceedings on the amendment shall be postponed. Who seeks recognition? Amendment over there, yeah. Ms. Bass? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It's number 44. The clerk shall distribute the amendment.
Does everyone see the copy of the amendment? Clerk, please report the amendment. Pass number 44, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3524. Without objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with and a point of order is reserved. And Representative Bass is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCall for bringing this important bipartisan legislation before the full committee today for consideration. I appreciate the inclusion of the Young African Leaders Initiative in this bill. The YALI Young African Leaders Initiative seeks to build the capacity of young African leaders in Africa in the areas of civic engagement, entrepreneurship, and business development by offering professional development and a global network to share expertise, including in the areas of civic leadership, election, human rights, good governance, and public management. Providing increased economic and technical assistance to young leaders and entrepreneurs and strengthening business and economic ties between the U.S. and the continent. In addition, awarding Mandela Washington fellowships to young leaders who have had a positive impact in their communities and demonstrated strong capabilities in entrepreneurship, innovation, public service, and leadership, and also in establishing regional leadership centers in sub-Saharan Africa, allowing young leaders to strengthen their skills in entrepreneurship, innovation, public service, and leadership. The YALI Act has two vital components that will be carried out by participants in the program. The U.S.-based component led by the Secretary of State in coordination with the Administrator for USAID will include the following. Number one, the Mandela Washington Fellows will participate in a six-week leadership institute at a U.S.-based university or college focusing on business, civic engagement, or public management. The sessions will include professional networking opportunities, community service, cultural activities, academic learning, and leadership training. Number two, the Mandela Washington Fellows will also participate in the annual Mandela Washington Fellowship Summit held in Washington, D.C., which will provide an opportunity to meet with U.S. leaders from the pi private, public, and NGO sectors. The YALI program was built on the premise of young leaders strengthening their knowledge and skills at U.S. institutions, connecting with other Africans from different regions and countries in Africa, and ensuring young leaders can harness their skills and take them back to their home countries while strengthening their own business, public, and civic spaces. The YALI Act would also continue to allow the U.S. to support and help strengthen the Africa-based component of the program that includes quality leadership training, professional development, and networking and online courses. Opportunities for networking with alumni, alumni of participants of YALI regional leadership centers and American and African professionals and experts. Through implementation of the YALI Act, the U.S. will promote U.S. policy goals in Africa by providing tools and resources to help young African leaders develop important skills and connections through online campaigns and public diplomacy initiatives and establish a system for monitoring, evaluating, and continued improvement of the YALI program. Um, YALI is an example of how I think we can strengthen our ties with Africa, but it's also a way to combat the influence of the Chinese. As I said in my statement earlier today, when you talk to African leaders, uh, whether they are elected leaders, appointed, et cetera, they will always tell you that they would much rather strengthen ties with us. And if they had a choice, they would work with us. And in my opinion, I think one of the most important things we can do is for us to step up rather than trying to discourage African countries from seeking resources that we can't provide to them. And I think the YALI program is a way of helping to prepare the next generation of leaders. And, and I think many of you might have had an opportunity to interact with YALI fellows. And every time I go and speak to the group that is at Howard University or they come up to the Hill, I walk out going, I hope that all of them go back to their countries and really assume leadership responsibilities. And one of the most important things they get out of the program is that they're able to build ties with other Africans in other countries on the continent that they would have never had an opportunity to be exposed to. So um, I appreciate it being included in the, uh, in the bill, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I strongly support uh, this amendment, and I thank Chairwoman Bass uh, for moving this forward uh, and, and this amendment. You know, I was a 
proud supporter of the Young American Leaders Initiative when it moved to the committee and onto the House floor when it passed uh, on suspension. I couldn't agree with the gentlelady more. YALI is very, very important. When we think about the connections these young people will make here in the United States and go back to Africa, when we think about it's actually an investment for us also because these are creating the leaders in Africa who will be uh, friendly to us in the United States and open up the doors for greater access and working together on the youngest and the fastest growing continent. This is just a win-win all the way around. So I thank the general lady for uh, pushing this forward and seeing it through and continuing at it and being uh, very <laughs> insightful about making sure that the continent of Africa is growing and having competent leadership that creates further democracies and benefits its people. And then they would always have the base of being here in the United States and working with those of us who are members of Congress. So I strongly support this amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, yield. Thank you. Yield and I'll be brief, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, acknowledge the extraordinary work of Congresswoman Bass, Chairwoman Bass, who um, I've had the privilege of seeing the work that she's done on the continent of Africa and the way she has brought people together of many different generations. And this legislation or this amendment is a reflection of kind of the approach that she has taken both to respond immediately to many of the challenges on the continent, but also to be setting, a, a, you know, beginning to develop young people so that really thinking about long-term leadership in, in, in a variety of countries throughout the continent. And it's sort of that short-term thinking and long-term planning that I think has made Congressman Bass such an extraordinary leader of this subcommittee. And this amendment reflects that, and I'm incredibly proud of the work she's done and urge everyone to support the amendment. Now you'll back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. McCall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, the gentlelady for introducing this bill. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this bill. Uh, you and I have worked on many um, basically stabilization bills for the continent of Africa together. The Global Fragility Act was, I think, a very uh, monumental uh, achievement. And um, just last night, we passed the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership Act. I think every graduate from the YALI program uh, will become an ambassador of the, of the United States in Africa. And that has a, such a great uh, ripple effect. Um, and you're absolutely right. When I talk to the uh, ambassadors from Africa, when we talk about China, they say, well, you're not here. And this puts us there, and it counters China, and it stabilizes the continent in, in areas where uh, extremism can flourish. And so no better way to, you know, we can drop a lot of bombs, but I think if you can educate and bring these ambassadors back, education can really make it big impact on the continent. So I, I applaud you for, for this, and I, I yield back. Gentlemen, yield. Uh, if I have time. Yeah. Thank you. I, too, want to, as a co-sponsor, and it's uh, hopefully it will perhaps still go through regular order. <laughs> we all know what the Senate's like. Uh, but I want to thank you for it. I'm glad to be a co-sponsor, and uh, uh, it's been great to work with you on this legislation and other bills as well. I yield back. Anyone else seeking time? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on the amendment uh, offered by Representative Bass. We're going to take a vote by voice. So all members, please unmute your microphones. <coughs> all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Now, unfortunately, um, we have votes that are coming up soon, and we have not taken a dinner break as of yet. And so I'm going to recess uh, the committee uh, until such time that uh, votes are concluded on the floor. <clears throat> the committee stands in recess.